there's two sides to every coin. Then there's a conversation you can join. But I'm an old dog and there's new tricks. And some of my opinions you just can't fix. Cause I'm an old man staring at the sky. I'ma shake my fist at the clouds and cry. Get off my lawn, you snowflake. Before I have a meltdown, breakdown, shakedown. Cause this is my hometown, so back down. Sports clown, it's all just a game. Oh, I don't have my ads ahead of me. What is up, Calgary? Uh, this is the Just a Game podcast with Rob Kerr. I am not Rob Kerr. I am Danny Austin, and that is not um, Rob Kerr. That is Cami Kepke. Um, is this Rob Kerr before he got his hair cut off at wrestling? Um, <laughs> Cami, how are you? Uh, you know what? I think uh, we both talked about this a little bit off air, but it's a bit of a gloomy day for uh, us. And it's more than just a game for a lot of people in our industry today. It matches the the jury weather we got there. But uh, many of our colleagues uh, across the country and outside of the country and sports media and media in general have lost their jobs today, including some pretty fantastic people here in Calgary, some amazing people up the highway in Edmonton. So hurting day for sports and news in general, but... Thank you for joining us, and we are, are still going to have some fun today. Yeah, no, we are going to have fun, yeah. but it's uh, no, you're right. Uh, obviously, Bell Media cut, I believe, 1,200 jobs, 13. um, 1,300 jobs, uh, coming a couple days after the athletic, um, cut a few jobs. So it's a weird time to be in sports media, but um, ultimately, that's probably well, I guess, media in general. Um, and I think I will be hosting um, my Live from the 55 podcast after this. And I'm probably going to kind of talk a little bit about how that affects, you know, my major job, which is covering the Calgary Stampeders and how, to be honest, I'm, I am pretty worried about if Bell Media is having to shed um, costs like this, what it might mean for, you know, the future of the CFL and, and, and their broadcast partnership with TSN. But um, that's obviously secondary to... Although, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even say friends, just people who I know from around and, you know, people who are in our industry and uh, you do this industry, you do this job because you love it and because you, you know, think it's important. You, you're not going to get rich being in, in media in Canada. No um, one has ever told you to do broadcasting for the money or the work-life balance. <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They tell you, they tell you, if you want to get rich, go to newspapers. Um, um, I don't know if I should say that on air, but yeah. So here we are. Um, it is also uh, just, oh yeah, just quickly. I think both of us wanted to, before we did anything else, sort of shout out. Um, you know, our colleagues, people in the industry, our our friends at Bell, and and let them know that we are thinking of them and they're in our thoughts and prayers and you know we love them and hope that they land on their feet and are here for, we, they need us and huge thanks to sponsors like oodle noodle and ski seller snowboard for keeping us on the air yeah. support them yeah. they're um, great i completely <laughs> forgot that my mic was live during the countdown um so i just been told that and then just proceeded to talk about how i didn't have my ad reads up in front of me so just <laughs> that's 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 professional podcasting youtubing right there um i will say we you know we, we have some great guests coming in, um, booked some of the book by you, uh, and then me over a beer just asking Julian if he'd come in and talk. <laughs> um, but this is a weirdly busy week in Calgary sports. Um, mm -hmm. Before we go, no, you know what? Let's start so that I'm, I'm set up to do my little segment about you. Um, before I do that, though, um, you are doing a lot of work with the surge. I am going to my oh, first yeah. surge game tonight yes, as a fan. Um, I know. So uh, mm -hmm. with my friend Alex and a couple other friends, how are you enjoying it? What's uh, what's the vibe been like? It's been incredible. You know, I um, it's not a knock on uh, hockey fans. I just think the culture of uh, certain sports from a fandom perspective are different. So I do find that like basketball fans, soccer fans are extremely loud, which makes it really fun, especially when you're in a bit of a smaller venue like Windsport as opposed to the Saddle Dome. But every game has been absolutely fantastic. There's so much Canadian talent there. And I think people who are coming out are realizing just how high the skill level is. Like just last week, uh, Justin Jackson on the surge was picked up by uh, Portland's new G League team in their expansion draft. These are guys who are really high level and it, this is their summer. It's like at the AHL 
Mm -hmm. really had a summer league. And uh, on Monday, we're going to have some stars like Rugsy Miller-Moore, Simi Shitu. Remember those names if you come out. Remember those names. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> they've got some great stories to tell. And it's just been a blast down there. The target score, make sure that you have to like keep your... Well, no one's sitting at the end, but <laughs> it makes sure you're there until the very end. It's a walk off every game. And Calgary has had some insane record setting comebacks already. But awesome. tonight they're playing the only team that has dished them a loss this season. Who is that? Uh, Vancouver. Vancouver. Okay. The Bandits. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, no, I am really looking forward to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyone who who sort of knows me non-professionally knows that basketball is actually my sort of one true love as far as sports go. Are you a purist? Um, How do you feel about the target score? I don't like it um i'll be real with you i don't like it um i don't i also haven't seen it in action i don't necessarily understand it fully um you know give me a 20 second clock but don't you know for for baseball pitching but otherwise i'm sort of like the score should be the score but that doesn't mean i'm open to it and i'm looking forward to it and uh, i really am excited because mm -hmm. i was told for many years when i moved to to calgary that this was not a basketball city um and i always sort of was out there playing on the courts around the the city and, and and never really felt that was true. I do think that there was a change in 2019 with the Raptors. Um, this is my first time wearing mm -hmm. a championship hat since the start of the pandemic. Um, but so yeah, I'm excited about it. And honestly, like it, it's not going to take much to sell me on the target score. It's mm -hmm. not like I'm like sitting here like oh, I hate it. I don't love it in principle. But let's see how it works. And if it, if it makes for exciting endings and gives the fans something to share about, that's what we're here for. I just hate like the slog. And I mean, you see it across so many sports. The slog of the last three, four, five minutes where it's just time out, just running the clock as much as you can. You have no idea how long it's going to go. Anything can happen and no one is ever truly out of it. Even the one loss Calgary's had this year was 84-81. They came back from 16 points down. The building could have been empty by that point. People could have decided, sure. all right, they're out of it. I'm going to head for the parking lot. And now you don't really have a reason to do that because they have all been insane finishes. Yep. Um, because we have to sort of before our guests get here, keep keep going. This is not me trying to move on from the surge. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that about 10 minutes before we went on air, uh, a guy who I had on the live from the 55 podcast on our very first episode, um, guy I've covered with the Calgary Stampede, sort of on and off since 2016, Derek Dennis announced his retirement from football, um, which I'm very, very sad to hear. He is one of my favorite people I've ever covered, has always been really, really kind to me. Um, helped sort of explain a lot of sort of the intricacies of offensive line play in the CFL um, over the years. And is just, uh, honestly, I think he's a class act and a, a Calgary Stampeders legend. Was sorry to see him let go um, at the end of training camp, but uh, I don't think you're going to find anyone around Calgary who has a bad word to say about Derek Dennis. So I just, I mean, congratulations on a great career and uh, we'll miss you, Derek, but you told me you'll be on the podcast next week. So uh, <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. Oh, we're going to miss him. Like such a personality, such a talented and hardworking player. Like you, there's nothing you can say to really tarnish that resume. Yeah. He did it all. 100%. There's nothing left for him to prove. It's unfortunate that it, it couldn't go long, on longer, but he's also just a fabulous person. And even at the, the start of the pandemic, uh, he hopped on a Zoom call with like our entire station to talk about Black Lives Matter and equitable coverage. And this was recently after John Cornish had come out and talked about some racist, racist experiences he had in Calgary. And Derek kind of talked about how that went for him, especially in his early years here and ways that uh, we as like a predominantly white newsroom need to cover things differently. And I always appreciated that he took the time to do that with us. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And I mean, as smart as it gets, that guy that and he's, he's, take all our jobs. he's the perfect <laughs> spokesperson for that type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know. He's he, he's just the best and um, most outstanding offensive lineman, I believe, in 2016. Multiple time all star. He is the best. Um, we're going to get to Ryan Huska. <laughs> we're going to have a lot of time to talk about. When Julian gets here, but um, in. 30 seconds. Just your thoughts on that hiring. I'm really excited to see how this goes. Hasco is a great guy. Uh, just chatting with him really quickly as he uh, walked out of the studio here. Yes, after he was on the barn burner. Yeah. With the barn burner guys, check, check it out. out. Give yeah. it a listen. If you haven't already, it's on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully you're just uh, watching straight through, through the entire day, but no, he's been great. He says that this is kind of the first day that it's really felt real. And he's finally moved some of his stuff into that office. It's amazing. Hasn't kicked um, his feet up on the desk, though. And then I am going to say, mm -hmm. because again, we have a pretty much a full hour where I imagine it's mostly going to be 
Ryan Huska talk. So I, I don't mm-hmm. want to go too far into that. Once to once to only gets here, we'll we'll dive in. But I will argue that the other um, big sports story this week was a uh, certain Cami Kepke was honored with the Fred Gus Collins Award. Um, we are all so proud of you. Um, can you tell me sort of what the award's for and how it came to be and you know how you're feeling about it? Yeah, thank you, Kim. I see you in the chat there. I really appreciate those kind words. And uh, honestly, like one of the best parts about this job since coming to Calgary, especially since I thought it was, you know, covering the NHL or bust, uh, covering local athletes and especially undercovered athletes like university athletes are. It's been the most gratifying part of the job at the Gus Collins Award is for the uh, Canada West Sports Reporter kind of of the year sports and reporter uh, of the year so, <laughs> so the uh, winners of uh, all of the conference awards uh, move on to be the nominees for this fred uh, fred scambetti award which is mm-hmm. the the national one and i was just in uh, quebec montebello to pick that one up yesterday and i know we never say that we do this for the recognition but it was a uh, a very special moment and uh, even though the sports cast isn't around now at global. There's still ways that we're going to give these athletes the equitable coverage that they deserve. And I love that it was a platform to make sure that we all female athletes in our cast and not just like, isn't it great they're doing this, but it's actually talking about like, no, this is their systems. This is what's changed this year. And we got to capture some really fantastic moments like the Mount Royal Cougars, a women's hockey team capturing their first national championship and almost busting that trophy. Because we amazing. support women's rights and wrongs here. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. Yeah, I'm going to vamp just for a second while we get <laughs> fully set up with our guests here. But I will just say, hey, Cammy, that, that award was so well-deserved. And uh, all of your friends sort of in, in sports media here are incredibly proud of you. And uh, congratulations. It's uh, Yeah, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment and so well-deserved. Making me blush, Danny. My uh, cheeks are going to go the color of your jacket. Um, I'm sweating so much yeah, in this jacket. Um, oh, yeah, our guests are wearing a... A puffer jacket and a hoodie. Couple choices. <laughs> um, Cammy, I'm going to let you take over here for a second and introduce our guests. A couple superstars here. Yeah, pull those mics right in. So uh, Cavalry FC picked up its second win of the young season with a 3-1 drubbing of Vancouver on the weekend. We have two stars of the team in studio. So Danny, the day that you were at the Saddle Dome for the presser where it was announced that Brad for Living would not be returning, we had Mr. Meyer Bevan in studio to talk about a very promising upcoming season. And he's back and the leading scorer in the CPL right now, partially thanks to a brace on the weekend. Two goals for the unaware. I know what a brace is. Okay, just checking, just (laughs) checking. (laughs) And a man with a rare honor taking the pitch at the famed Wembley Stadium, Mr. Joe Mason, who was the goal leader for the Cavs the last two seasons. So welcome, guys. And uh, how are you feeling about the season so far? Hey, thank you guys for having us. Um, No, I mean, it was quite an odd start to the year. Obviously, we had uh, quite a few draws. And I think now, I think the season's starting to turn. I think the boys, especially on the weekend, were brilliant. I think now it's just we've got a platform now to build off going into this week against Halifax. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's from now on it's, it's been good and hopefully it can just continue. And Joe, we kind of got to – we'll just get it out of the way right off the bat. I know you've yeah. uh, had some injury issues this year. Uh, how's your back doing right now and uh, where are you kind of at? It's good. Today was my um, my first day fully training with the boys. So I think this weekend might be a bit soon for me, but hopefully I'll be back and bowl for the, the game at York next week. Awesome. And uh, so, Meyer, you've already uh, topped your goals from last year and we're only uh, nine games in. So what's been uh, working for you early on? Yeah, well, I mean, I was quite injury prone last year, you know, so to come in and to have a good start and to just get minutes under my belt has been good, you know. And I mean, obviously, I, I'm lucky enough to have scored, but it's down to the boys, you know, around me. I think the young boy Gote on the weekend was brilliant, put one on a plate for me. So I think the whole team's been good, you know, and people like Joe coming back in now, I think we're only going to get stronger. So Joe leading the team with eight goals and seven goals. Uh, how do you feel about this one coming for your title? I know, yeah, he's um, we're good friends off the pitch as well. So we're fighting for, for that, I suppose, on the pitch to, to score the most goals. But I'm delighted to see that he's, he's staying injury-free, first, first of all. And... Uh, in the back of the net on a consistent basis i'm sure if he keeps himself fit he'll, he'll have a very good year i hear you two are pretty inseparable off the pitch and some pretty good banter going on just how did that all kind of start for you like what what clicked i don't know when it started it was quite early on in preseason last year but yeah i mean me and joe we're best mates off the field you know so i mean 
I've, I'm sure you've seen the celebration. If not, I mean, you'll see it again. But yeah, it's 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 awesome, you know, having someone like him at the club, like who's had a career like he has, and I'm obviously like coming up in my career, and he's teaching me every day. You know, we are good friends off off the field, but on the field, he's it's it's awesome to be around someone like him. So, I mean, I am grateful that Joey's here. So, off the field as well, you know, dinners and everything, but <laughs> on the field more. You know, he's he's been awesome, man mentor to me while I've been here. I am so glad you brought the celebration up. <laughs> so Danny, I don't know if you know the story. So Mario, you got to tell it, Angel. Mm. We finally have a chance for you to respond. Yeah. <laughs> Did me tell it? Tell her. You started. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, no, well, okay. We went to Mexico last year and for preseason and um, Joey got pink eye, you know, so he's always rubbing his eye every day, training, <laughs> dinners, everything. And I'm like, he wouldn't take his hand off his face. So I said, <laughs> if on. I score, I'm going to put my hand over my eye. And then, to be fair, Joey scored first and he did it. And then I scored. And then it just became a thing. We've done it ever, ever since. But That's yeah, everyone thinks it's a different story behind that. But Joey just had his hand on his face for like three months. So. Yeah, it's just yeah. Mexican pink eye. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is. Really. You got a tattoo of it now? Yeah, I got a tattoo on my leg now. Yeah. What? Yeah. Got what the, is it? The, the, the emoji. Okay. There's like an emoji that has one hand over its eye. It's on my leg now forever. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. How did you feel the first time like you watched back the highlights and you started to see, I know you just see that over and over again. Yeah. Um, no, it's funny that everyone was asking us you know, in the press conferences after what, uh, what's the reason behind it. And then we tell them and they'd be a little bit like, a bit weird, you know. But, um, <laughs> it's stuck nah, though. It's, it's stuck. stuck you get yeah. little kids doing it now as well, you know. Yeah, all the kids. See little kids at games doing it and stuff like that. So it's all taken up a bit. Yeah. That's amazing. More diligent about washing your hands now, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not. I'm not. Not rubbing his eyes so much. <laughs> and uh, Joe, like uh, you're really close to coming back now. It sounds like, which is awesome for fans to hear. But you've devoted so much of your life to this sport. Uh, do you get a different perspective on the game when you're kind of forced to take a step back and uh, watch and see what things look like from the outside and what some of these young kids are doing with the new opportunities? Yeah, of course. It's always a good opportunity when you're when you're injured to sort of take a step back and look at things you could sort of improve on. But it's also nice to see other people come in. Um, like Maya said, Gote's coming in now and getting his chance. And it's nice to see him flourish because he's he had a really good preseason and um he sort of had to bide his time and wait for his chance and he took it on the weekend. And yeah, so it's nice to see other boys, you know, sort of kicking on and progressing when you, you can't really help the team. Danny, have you been down to a game yet at Spruce Meadows? I've been down to many games. I initially like I covered the team for like a couple games the first season and I didn't have time because of the Stampeders. But yeah, no, I'm a I covered like back the uh the Foothills under 23 team. Like I yes, bro. Yeah, yeah, I've been there with Tommy from like from the start. Yeah, um, that's sick. Yeah, I like I'm I'm an Arsenal supporter, so like I watch. Oh, so am I. Really? Are you? Yes. Okay. Um, how do you like the Declan Rice? He's like, coming, he's coming he's for coming. sure. 100 percent It's done. Yeah. yeah. Hubbards, maybe as well. Have you seen that? I saw that too. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about him to be honest. Yeah. But like no. it's also I don't know. I might just not know about him because he's a Chelsea yeah. guy. So who I mean, did you support growing Liverpool. up? Liverpool? Yeah. Okay. How do you feel about McAllister? Mm. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Do you like the McAllister signing? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a very good signing. Yeah. I think it's better than uh Declan Rice. You would and have it. This guy's yeah. a <laughs> <It's fair. laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. I like Champions well. League. Look, I anything that solidifies our midfield, I'm I'm good with. Yeah, I mean, you need it. We need it. Well, we need. <laughs> yeah. Um, not even need, Champions. Like, not even Champions League. Bro. Right. He's a World Cup winner, though. This guy, bro. My dad's Argentine, so I yes, he is a World Cup <laughs> winner. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, Danny was trapped in Argentina at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was in Buenos Aires, and I went down like on like the Sunday, and then the pandemic was like declared on the Tuesday. Oh. So I, uh, yeah, I was there for like four days. Um, so it was a lot of flying for four days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I then basically my mom like yelled at me and was like, G "You have to come home." Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, "Cool." I rewatched my flight, and I just like. No one's had a crazier 24 hours than me in Buenos Aires. Like yeah. when I was like, all right, I'm gonna be locked at home when I yeah, leave. Yeah, yeah. I have all this money that I'd saved. So <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. I like I didn't go to a Boca game, but like that was it turns out it's really hard to get tickets. Mm, I would like, imagine you think as a tourist you're just gonna be able to kind of go and and like no, not a chance. No. So yeah, yeah. Um off topic, but yeah. sort of on topic. Yeah, it's soccer talk. <laughs> yeah. Um can I just ask like since she asked. 
and I'm, I'm sure you guys get asked about the crowd all the time, but like Calgary does have the best like setup and crowd in the CPL, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not just being biased even. I know you sort of have to say that, but uh, yeah. now by far we get the best numbers, I think for sure. Yeah. Um, and the atmosphere, they're the loudest. Easily. We have the foot soldiers that you probably know about and um, they always bring it every game, no matter what, when, if we're winning or losing, if it's, thunderstorms if it's hot you know they're there every week and uh, no i agree with you they're by far the best fans in this league what's number two halifax probably i'll say halifax yeah yeah, yeah their and grounds are really nice yeah, yeah they get a good good amount as well i feel like it's all about i mean not all about but like partially just about having the right size like stadium right 100 percent. like yeah. obviously you see like other teams i mean in winnipeg you know beautiful stadium but this gets outnumbered by the seats you know whereas ours is close compact and you like really feel it when you're on the pitch and obviously i think teams come in here that's why our home record's so good you know there's people struggle to come and deal with that yeah you know, it's quite it's quite difficult there like joe said the foot soldiers are there whether it's raining or if it's hot so it's good yeah they were yeah. chanting a we want 10 after you guys got the the three in the first <laughs> half there and uh, i like i was a little concerned like maybe a foot soldier watching can chime in but have you ever been concerned about them running out of uh, smoke for the flare? <laughs> I promise you, what they will they never run out? out of smoke. <laughs> those guys, no. they bring that every week. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, your next home game, uh, Halifax, this weekend actually, and then uh, you come back for the twenty fourth, and that is also going to be the Pride game. And the Foot Soldiers have been huge in their support of that as well, raising money every year. What do you make of that? Yeah, no, it's awesome. You know, you see them on social media. I think it's a brilliant thing to get behind um and yeah i mean the the foot soldiers they're a unique group of people you know and they every week they're there they're supporting they support you no matter what what's happening what's going on so i mean i i can't thank them off enough for the support they've given me and i'm sure joe's the same on and off the pitch so yeah it's a good group of people sure. i would say just like being around town like it's crazy how it's not crazy but like it's wild how many people like there's two guys on my like slow pitch team and they just like they're obsessed with you guys like it's like in like what four or five years it's become like his number one thing this guy and he just goes every game and like i was like pretty optimistic when the club team launched but i had no idea that it would get to that level where it's actually like it's number one for a lot of people and it's an amazing thing given that the club didn't exist five well six years ago right so yeah so that's credit to you guys as well as the foot soldiers who mm. have done an amazing job yeah i mean like i was there the when you guys i don't know if you guys were on the team at the time but like when you guys beat Montreal, Vancouver, um, and like that was insane. That was first year with uh, yeah. Dom Zator. Oh, mm -hmm. was yeah. it? Uh, were him and uh, Victor just training with you guys? Yeah, uh, just Dom, but Vic, Vic's been back. We've both seen Vic while he's been back. But yeah, it's so good for those two. You know, they're progressing now, moving on to the national team. It's, it's awesome to see. You know, especially young Vic. I play. I, I mean, I played with Dom at Whitecaps, but um, Vic, you know, coming in, doing what he did, going over to Scotland. Now he's playing for national it's, it's unbelievable football is a crazy game you know it can change so fast mm -hmm. and I'm, we're both so happy for him yeah. do you guys like Messi coming to Miami I do yeah. I mean I'm a, I'm a big Ronaldo fan big uh, Ronaldo yeah, fan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah massive but like obviously it's it's unbelievable for the sport so this side of the world you know you're gonna see especially for the our league in my, even our league you know it's gonna filter through football the World Cup coming that's gonna explode you know Messi's if not he's the second biggest name but one of the biggest names in football so you know it's going to be unbelievable for the sport this other world i feel like it's a lot of like probably the most hype i felt around american soccer probably since i was a kid and david beckham came over yeah i mean when you consider mm -hmm. that i mean unlike ronaldo he has a world cup um it's <laughs> out <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about this all day <laughs> yeah no i mean i think it's i think it's bigger than beckham to be honest and oh I, no it definitely yeah. is but it's just kind of like the last time i remember it having such an impact yeah. here yeah it's so maybe cool it's also Beckham's because part Beckham's of it, my know? favorite movie so yeah yeah it's a good film it's but beckham's part of it that's why it's crazy like mm -hmm. he was the biggest now he's just produced the the biggest thing it's crazy circle of life i mean you guys came a long way as well to be playing here uh is your family here right now yeah they're both here they're at home right now my mom and my brother have come to visit as well so everyone's at home yeah has it hold your brother yeah uh, he's eight he loves joe oh my <laughs> days he's obsessed with joe he wants his name on the shirt not mine <laughs> it's crazy is he obsessed with him just because he likes you as a person or as a player i don't know both. i hope in a bit both 
he knows everything about he was telling me about my career you know yeah, like, he's like only searched eight, them up and stuff tallest eight year old i've ever seen though <laughs> he's massive, yeah he's huge yeah. <laughs> he's really a big boy um yeah he's funny kid. He's, yeah, i like him a lot you guys just gonna slap a jersey on him and throw him in at training and hope that no one notices or what <laughs> yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's almost as tall as sujo camargo so he could be in there he could be <laughs> in the bunch soon yeah i hope you're listening sergey <laughs> Has he got in on the training? No, he's he's been he's come to quite a few actually. He's been on the outside watching, but he loves to be around the boys. You know, like Joe said, he's obsessed with football, so he knows everything. So it's cool to have them here, especially. Unbelievable! Is he on the TikTok? He actually is. He started like two weeks ago. He's 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 doing his thing. It's awesome. Yeah. He's following in your footsteps. Yeah. So you guys are like I know nothing about this. The only thing she told me was that you guys are. I don't know if it's both of you or just you, but like you guys are really into tiktok ah, it's me yeah okay. it's me. hit a pretty big milestone recently what's the milestone yeah. uh i mean we, we got a good amount of following you know that's that's the milestone but i mean it's not just me it's my my partner julia and then but the main is mickey lou my my daughter she's like if it's just a video of me and my partner it's like the views are like me but if it's a video of my daughter it's like goes ballistic so yeah it's that's crazy amazing. she's love she's a very loved little girl which is awesome I think one of the first ones I saw was uh, when you two were reunited after uh, how long had you been apart when uh, they were finally able to come here at the start mm. of the, the season or training camp? Yeah, four months. Yeah. Four months. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. It changes long. a lot. Yeah, they change a lot in four months. Yeah. TikTok for you, Joe? No, not for me. Not that. <laughs> the old boy doesn't know about it. I don't want to do any of that stuff. <laughs> I'm like almost 40, so I just don't understand it. I met a girl at a bar, like, this is probably last summer. Um, and like, she was cool, but she was like, oh, no, like, my dog is a TikTok influencer. And her dog had, like, 400,000 followers. Yeah. And I couldn't tell if she'd monetized it at all. Mm. Like, I, I don't know if she was making it. You can. Money. That's the crazy thing about the app. You can, like, like, I know I have friends the exact same, has a dog, same kind of vibe. Yeah. And they're, they're making cash off their dog, you know? It's crazy. It's crazy. I wouldn't even say it was, like, a particularly, like, notably cute dog. Yeah. Like, it was just a dog. And I, like, <laughs> I was like, man, writing for newspapers, I'm... I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> um, is Ford still the big rivalry? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, that sort of weak build up to playing Ford seems to be a little bit different to mm. the other teams we play. You know, they've sort of knocked us out in recent years. So I think that's the biggest rivalry. For Cavs. Things seem to uh, bubble over a little bit too when you play Halifax. There is a, a little bit of a skirmish during that uh, two-two draw this year. Yeah, they always might have picked up a yellow. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on three now. I need to be careful. But no, there always is. I mean, like you said, Halifax is always. I don't know. It seems we've always had like butted heads, but Forge. I think if you've watched the Forge games, they tend to bubble bubble over. You know, so it's yeah. I think it's a two. I mean, Pacific as well, very good this year. I think, but um, Forge and us, I think, at the two biggest teams in the league like the short amount of time this league's been around i think we're the two biggest teams every time we played against them i think like joe said the whole week is heightened yeah. so you know like looking at the standings though like you guys have a game in hand and are four points back of like forge and united like you guys are right in the mix at this mm. point eh? mm -hmm. yeah yeah considering the start we had you know i think maybe one for the first six draws yeah it's not a great start for that's us gotta be really. so frustrating eh? oh yeah bro. It was like, I don't know, because we'd been so good in games as well, which is frustrating. Like, if you're scrapping and going away to put, like, teams and scrapping for a one all, you're buzzing. You're leaving happy and they're gutted, you know? Yeah. But we're dominating teams for 95% of the game and, like, two mistakes. And you're like, we're sitting here at 2 2 and you're like, this sucks, you know? That's why it's been so hard because the results, I don't think, have reflected how well we've been playing. Yeah. Whereas now on the weekend, we put a whole nine together and we, Whitecaps couldn't, oh, sorry, Vancouver couldn't get near us, I don't think so. It's like, I just play FIFA career mode. Like, I don't mm -hmm. go online because, honestly, kids are mean. <laughs> um, but, like, every time I get a draw, like, my little manager guy, when he does his post game, talks about how he'd rather, like, win one and lose one than draw two. Mm -hmm. um, which is, like, I don't know, the, the whole three points versus two for winning. Like, I don't know, changes things. Mm -hmm. changes I don't know what lot. the point is, but, yeah. 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 Like, but if we if we had like won two of those games, we're sitting first, and we should have won f four. Really, you know, yeah. that's why it's hard. Well, I feel like a big theme with some of those early games too was getting that lead, and just late in the game, like you said, one mistake and boom, you're tied up. And then we saw like what was it, four minutes in on the weekend, you guys give up a tough one. Uh, what does that bounce back kind of say about the resilience or what you guys learned from some of those early disappointing matches? 
Um, well, with, not on the weekend, but the games before, we'd always take the lead. You know, so it was, it was more of a case of holding on to it, um, which we, we were struggling with. Um, but on the weekend, it, it was like the tables turned a little bit. They scored first, and it was like it was new for us, a new test. Would we bounce back? And yeah, and within, I think you scored within what? Seven, 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 minutes. seven minutes or something after they scored. And then it was just wave after wave. And um, it was only 3 1, but it could have been five or six towards the end, I think. Well, how close were you to the hat trick? Oh, hit the crossbar. <laughs> but then Soji scored, so it's fine, you know. It's, it's, as long as it goes in, doesn't matter how it goes in. But yeah. Can I ask, as a Liverpool supporter, mm-hmm. would you rather have like Arsenal have won the league or City this year? He's an Arsenal fan. So, so City? So City. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, just Julian, who's coming later, like, is a United guy. And he was like, it kills me, but I want Arsenal to win at yeah. one point because just to keep City mm. from the treble. But they're flying, though. They're really, and they're only going to be better. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah. It's crazy. And so Danny mentioned a bit earlier his uh, kind of main gig is covering the Calgary Stampeders. Mm-hmm. I know I asked you last time, like, if you're going to play Canadian football, what position would you want to be, Joe? How about you? Is this yeah. that one? Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard question. Out. <laughs> I wish they could see this right now. Yeah. Just say quarterback. It's a lot of thinking there for him. Yeah. One on the wing. Yeah. Yeah. Just, catch. Yeah. Just catch the ball, man. Wide receiver. Yeah. yeah, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not big. That's cool. No, Back home, anyway, it's not like, very popular. The side of the world that's crazy. Huge. Well, maybe that's something we have to do with you guys this season. Just try to get them out to uh, some field somewhere and put them through their paces. Oh, I'm sure with all that gear on that those boys wear. Oh, wow. oh my days. It's credit to those guys. You know, they're unbelievable athletes. Yeah. They run faster than us with so much stuff on. It's crazy. Even just breaking in the helmets, though, it's a nightmare. It feels like it's just going to squeeze your brain out of oh. your ears. Crazy. Yeah, not good. My theory is that every sport's different because, like, most people can't run as much as you guys do. Like, if you ever actually, like, I know, I mean, I don't know if the CPL does it, but, like, with the Premier League, they add up how much someone ran in a game, and it ends up being, like, 14 miles or something. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not running 14 miles. Which is I'm not, I like, have no interest in that ever. So, well, one of the kids yeah. on the weekend, uh, Eric Hobza, who was uh, previously at UFC, what did they say? He covered 11 clicks in the game. Yeah, 11 Ks. Shout out to Cobza, by the way. He's been unbelievable since he's come in. You know, he's a young boy come in in the midfield. I think he's been he's been brilliant for us. You know, so yeah, big shout out to him. And like you said, he's been he runs and runs and runs. And he's got long legs, so he covers a lot of ground. But yeah, I think he's been brilliant since he's come in. Him and Gote, young boys, so. Yeah, big shout out to those two. Yeah, and go to, I think they said he got up to how fast was he rolling? You should see this guy at training. He is rapid. Was he the fastest? Oh. Bro, he is so fast. Like yeah. it's crazy. Like it's different, huh? Outrageous. I've yeah. never seen anything anything like it. Like you can imagine in one of those clicks in the game is like I don't know, one sprint. If you give him an open field and just say, you know, run and finish, you should see how fast he moves then. It's crazy. Insane. Yeah. Just because, like, do you pay attention to the ashes? I want to really take this off the rails here and just like <laughs> yeah. make sure that like uh, no one in it's Calgary. Very, it's very popular. Yeah, I can't. It is. Yeah, there's there's a rivalry there. Um, I don't know a hell of a lot about, about cricket. But, he can't play. Yeah, but I do pay attention. He can't play. <laughs> I'd bowl you middle stump. Are you playing? Behave yourself, <laughs> bro. Yeah, I'll you bowl you middle stump, bro. You be swinging. All right, whatever. Um, <laughs> Are you a bowler? I'm, I was a fast bowler at school. Yeah. Okay. He's going out. I Forget only know about it because, like, all the like British like websites I go to to check up on Arsenal, it's all ashes right now. Oh. Um, and I lived in London in like 2006, and like it's the most confusing sporting event. Yeah. In the world, like it's, it's not really something I. It's big though. Isn't it? Grew up with. It's, it, ashes is big, yeah, yeah. but. It's just crazy that they're competing over the ashes of a of a stick. That's just like, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's crazy. It's it's make it so. I feel like a really bad sports reporter right now because all of that was just like Australia over England, the head. Yeah, Australia and England play every two years, I think. Yeah, I think so. And it's they literally it's just they're playing over the ashes of a burnt cricket bat. I think possibly it's the. He's a stump. Stump, sure. You can tell how much I know about it. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, and they take a, it's like 
they say it's really serious. Like it's a really big deal. So I, don't know, I just wanted to ask. Yeah. I told you I would just jump in and ask whatever I wanted. To consider. <laughs> I did a little bit of no prep. Yeah, so. earlier I'm like, do you want me to send you some of like my notes? And you're like, no. <laughs> no, man, we're good. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you too, like uh, what's the connection and the chemistry been like with uh, Ali Moosey this year? You guys uh, had your contracts uh, extended around the same time. And I know uh, Tommy said he really wanted to uh, kind of see you guys working together. Yeah, Moosey, like... Moosey is unbelievable, you know, he's a good friend of mine. And I think if you've been watching our games, you see like he's, I think he's the best player in the league, you know, and I'm sure, I mean, a lot of people think that as well, but yeah, he's been brilliant this year for us. And yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, we're finding each other on the field, you know? So I think once Joey's back, it's like a, the first game against Forge. If you saw that game, I think the connection was high and the connection just carried on. Once Joey's back, I think it's only going to get better. So no, Moosey's, yeah. I don't know. You have to watch Moosey to really appreciate Moosey, you know. So, but I think he's been brilliant this year. That's unreal. And you guys have so many former players now who are in the front office working through the training camp. Mason's freaking out, running through the stands whenever he doesn't agree with a play. But what's it like for you seeing those guys around trying to transition into those new roles? Yeah, it's good. Like you said, we, there's players who are currently playing as well now. Isky's doing a lot of um, office work. Well, there's Ollie who's come back into the staff. Ollie, who was yeah, Ollie Minotau, who's who I played with, is back now. Um, Tofa, Tofa, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people change. Yeah, it's nice. It's um, it's not like that sort of uh, relationship you normally have with staff, you know, because you're playing with them as well, or you played with them. So it's a nice sort of transition for them as well from playing into going into the next chapter. For, if you know what I mean. I think it helps a lot as well, you know, like. Ollie's Ollie being a player like recently, like last two years, and now he's moved. It's so easy to communicate and to talk with, with you know, you've been just stood next to him with within the same shirt, and then now he's on the staff. So, like Joe said, it's a, it's cool to see that transition. You know, it's awesome. Down the road, however many years, uh, whenever you eventually hang up the cleats, is that something that you see yourself doing, getting into the business and operations side? Uh Personally, no, not for me. I think once football football is done for me, I think, you know, I have to, I want to move on to something else, but I'll obviously still be a supporter from the outside. But I mean, I mean, but you never know, you know, I don't want to say no in case, you know, things change a lot. But no, I think football, once it's done, it's done. You know? Too much stress otherwise. <laughs> um, I can't see myself doing that, but I would never say never to anything, you know, but um, if I was to, had to decide today i'd probably say probably not I'm not too sure what i'd do how's tommy changed as a as a manager i mean well, you've been here longer than me but um i think this year in terms of football wise i think we're i don't think he's i mean personally i think he's changed a lot as a person but i think the way we're trying to approach games and play this year has changed since last year i think um we're more on the ball and we're like not um I don't know. I think in recent years, Cavalry has been quite a physical side, you know, hard to beat, which I still think we are, but I think we're adding a side to our game now where we're playing, we're creating more opportunities in the games. You know, I think, I don't think he's changed. I think he's just added something on top of what he already had. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Too telling Pender on the weekend he should be Tommy for Halloween. <laughs> like if he straightened out that mop and just got like the nice suit going. The red tie? Yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> That'd be good. I like that. When do you guys take off for Halifax? I will leave tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Yeah. Is that a direct flight? Uh, I hope so. Bro. Yeah, but I think it's like yeah, it's, not, it's like yeah. five five hour flight. That's the last game. Then next week, York Joe is back. Hey, back here he comes, guys. Watch out. Heard it here first. Yes, sir. That's awesome. Hey, what's the worst? Because I, I know uh, here, like we joke about junior hockey players, they have to take these mental bus rides from Winnipeg to Seattle, just across your careers, maybe not even in the CPL. Like what's the worst kind of like travel situation you've had to deal with? I mean, Joe's had a longer career than me, but me yeah. is my, personally is Halifax, to be honest. Like that's, that is quite a trick to go. And the time changes, like the whole, Everything about it is quite tough on the body, especially like with my injuries last year. You know, it's hard to sit on a plane for that long. But I don't know, Joey. Um, yeah, when I was young, I used to play for Plymouth, which is right at the bottom of England, south. And we would play the team called Carlisle, which is on the border of Scotland. 
and we would have to bus it on a Tuesday night. So we play at 7.45, finish at like 10. And it's like an eight or nine hour drive. So oh, I'd be getting in and my mum and dad already left for work, you know? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was the longest one. That was, yeah, that was the worst one I've had, I think. That's brutal. Because you hear like guys who come from Europe to play like MLS in particular, they say like it, the travel has more of an impact than like your average person realizes, eh? Yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure, yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. You got some yeah. keys to the game this weekend? In terms of what? Oh, give me your scouting report on Halifax. What, are, what should oh. we be looking out for? I mean, to be fair, I think we've done a lot of work on ourselves this week. I think we're not too worried about We know how they play. We played them not too long ago. Now, that's the thing about this league. You play everyone four times, so you kind of get a gauge of everyone you know. So I think now it's just about building off what we did last week and like the way we played last week. If we do that again, I think not many teams in this league can get near us, you know, and especially with the distance we're about to have, I don't think. Yeah, Any, pro I, yeah. Any projects, yeah. things you want to plug while you're here? Uh, not me. I'm pretty low-key, you know. Yeah, no, nah, not, not with me. Sure? Yeah, no, I'm good, mate. <laughs> oh, actually, uh, one question uh, from the fans here. Uh, foot soldiers want to know when you're going to follow their TikTok. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I do. That's awkward. Yeah, I will though. If I haven't already, I'm pretty sure I do. But if if I don't, I'll follow them right after this. <laughs> Directly. <laughs> they have like a group TikTok. Yeah, I, I assume so. I download I know TikTok Cavalry like do. just to <laughs> watch Myers right before I interviewed him for the first time, and uh, the app has since been offloaded on my phone because I never used it again. Oh really? Good. Um, also yeah. my Instagram, like, I, do, you know how they... I can't do tiktok like my little like uh she's like my sister she's like 19 and uh we had a house party and she asked me and my friend to do a tiktok dance with her do you remember and it the was dance? so bad it was the it was kesha oh. it was awful i can't dance i suck you still set the phone up and did it though didn't you but it was yeah. so bad she woke up the next morning and deleted her whole account and just started again <laughs> it was probably an indictment of our dancing skills like but. i'm not on tiktok but like i do like like instagram's like reels same but, thing yeah but like the same thing two weeks later they're no they're suggested reels for me it's like you know like the algorithm decides what you like and mm -hmm. it's all like oceans like sharks and big waves and, like i don't even <laughs> like the ocean but like i really like the, the ocean <laughs> yeah yeah so. and it's like so the more i watch them the yeah, more yeah. it's just like that's what it's it yeah. yeah um so i don't know i now follow like ocean lovers united and like all of these like <laughs> yeah, so, know, that sounds I like would... a terrible soccer team yeah but like i'm like not like i don't like swimming in the ocean like i like i i don't like sharks so it's like i don't know how it happened and it's not like surfing either it's just like look at this big wave and i look at it like yeah that's a sick big wave like, so yeah simple that's, man that's Surf him up. social media anecdote. there's a famous shark in uh halifax pops up there every year uh, and there's like actually quite a lot of surfing down there so oh, keep your yeah. eyes peeled that's sick mm -hmm. do you guys get any time in away cities to actually like explore yeah we do um after training, we train like in the morning and then maybe like a couple hours in between like dinner or lunch. Mm. Halifax is nice as well. Have yeah, you been? beautiful yeah. city. I lived there for a year. So. Yeah, I yeah. used to yeah. live a uh, little north of there in New Brunswick. No That's one it. gives New Brunswick a lot of love, but I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, oh, it's a great town. Yeah, but Halifax nice. was the big city that you'd escape to. Yes. Uh, yeah. You guys oh. did the lobster rolls out there yet? No, no. Is that a thing? I never ate lobster. You've never eaten lobster? Uh, huh. I don't think I Sorry, had I don't know why I acted like that. It was surprising. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of lobster. I thought it was like the first thing you check off your list when you go to Halifax. Well, I assume you guys are fed the whole time you're there, right? Yeah, we get. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. There we go. No yeah. food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all right. Cool. Thank you so much for coming in, guys. Uh, good luck this weekend. Can't wait to see you back on the pitch uh, weekend after this. It's the 24th at Atco Field. Go check them out. It's going to be a great vibe down there for the Pride game. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys coming out, man. Thank you. Guys. Yeah. Hey, Good thank luck you guys for having us. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. um, Until next time. <laughs> I'm going to do an ad read here. Guests are brought to you by Ski Cellar Snowboard. They opened their doors in Calgary back in 1946, which just means they've been open for 76 years here in Calgary. For the summer, please visit them at their McLeod Trail location by Chinook Center. And, of course, they are experts when it comes to skis and snowboards, but they are so much more. Ask them about snow skating. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Check out their thanks guys. Check out their clothing and warm weather gear too. 
Bam. That was very natural, Danny. I'm I'm getting better at ad reads. Um, it's something that for my own podcast we're trying to work on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I love ski seller snowboard, so that's good. Um, I also, I mean, I feel like at some point I should probably say that we are live in the Oodle Noodle Studio. Local loves delicious. Since opening their first store back in 2005, Oodle Noodle has been all flavor and just the right amount of weird. They've got two locations, 1244 17th Avenue and in Airdrie at 105 Main Street North. So we're doing great. Look at that. I actually go to the Airdrie one. Like, I know it's weird because, like, we're in Calgary, but I always get paint from Airdrie. There's a certain type of paint that I like for, uh, like, rhinos. I mean, I just, like, it's right there. So you just kind of, like, pop by on the way out. I mean, I'm not going to say where you live, obviously, but it's not close to Airdrie. So um, that's deeply strange. where the good paint is, though. Okay. There you go. Um, That's great. I I don't paint. So um, that was awesome, man. The cavalry guys (laughs) rule. Those guys are really cool. Um, and I'm actually going to keep my eyes peeled for those uh, young kids doing the pink eye selling next time I'm down there. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, well, no, and it is cool. And like, I think that, to be honest, just because I have been very sort of inundated with Stampeders and Flames over the last probably month, um, sort of the last I'd really checked in on them was when they were on that run of draws. Um, so I was unaware, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Um not that I did no prep, but I didn't do a ton of prep for that because I knew you were going to sort of take the lead. That's sort of your your baby. I don't know if that's right, but I wasn't aware. They are right in the mix for first place, and I, I do feel like... Oh, there's a lot of season to go. Yeah, they had yeah. a really tough run last year. It was just so many injuries. I didn't even know that many knees could go in a season. But despite all that, they managed to set a franchise record for a point streak. You know, obviously, like, there's draws mixed in, but not lose an end. Obviously, they can still carry on with that. Mm-hmm. They got a really strong team. And as soon as you have Joe Mason back in the mix, like your scoring is going to go up. He's a, he'd be a golden boot contender if he had a full healthy season. Like no question to me. That's amazing. I will say, and I don't want to like criticize our guests, the idea that Ronaldo above Messi um, is absurd. And I'm not going to allow that to stand on a podcast that I'm guest hosting here. It's very um, brave of you as soon as they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I sort of called him out on it. But uh, no, he seems like the best dude. I mean, and we all have opinions that are wrong. And that's totally fine. Um, but like the idea of Ronaldo over Messi, who in there? Come on. I mean, because I know more about soccer than that guy. Um, <laughs> right. So, yeah, clearly me, the expert here. Um, just digging myself a hole. Uh, you got anything you want to talk about? <laughs> oh, man. I'm just excited to have Julian come in here because we got a. Oh, yeah. oh I could keep going. I just didn't want to like continue to just literally just criticize our guest's opinion um because i'm very grateful that they came in and um yeah that's that's good i will say um stan peters playing in ottawa Mm -hmm. tomorrow so um i may talk about that for just a little bit because i do think like it's been interesting uh could be in carry sort of six game injured list six game injured list hugely disappointing yeah it is a great to start again yeah i mean it was like that that game last week was so weird Um, i feel like it's almost when things just go that sideways, that's probably easier to park it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were the the question and it's, I mean, we, we mentioned Derek Dennis retiring earlier. Um, I think that they took a pretty big risk um, letting Derek go and, and, and rolling with sort of ultimately unproven players. Uh, Hugh Thornton did play a little bit last year at right mm-hmm. tackle, but uh, you know, just to, quickly provide context julian good jones was their starting right tackle he signed with the philadelphia eagles uh derek was expected to do their starting left tackle he was released at the end of training camp has retired today so they're they're starting sort of unproven guys there and i think that to be honest i think that we really saw the impact of that um i, I think that the run game when kadeem you know got a got a couple steps go in he he did what he always did which is go hard downfield get his head down mm-hmm. bounce around he was exceptional but i mean he they didn't give the ball to him very much. Part of that is that they fell behind. Part of that is I don't think that the offensive line was opening up big holes. Um, I will say that um, Zach Williams is also back at left guard, which is going to make a huge difference. But, like, it's very interesting going into this game against Ottawa because, like, the Red Blacks have the reigning most outstanding defensive player in, in uh, Lorenzo Maudlin, and it's going to be a huge challenge for an offensive line that has a lot of – a lot of work to do so losing Kadeem matters that said like and this is what happens i'm not actually criticizing anyone here but like mm-hmm. you know i put out yesterday at practice oh he's in a big boot and the immediate media response from out of the market is oh this is a huge loss and it is 
Cedric Mills also ran for 100 yards and several I games say, last like, year. If there's like, one spot where I'm not like super concerned about depth on the Stampeders, like you have a lot of exciting kids yeah, like, in the run game. They're running. And Peyton Logan and Cedric Mills are both like, mm-hmm. I, I think, capable of being um, starting starting running backs. And I, I think that they're going to prove that. And I'm mm-hmm. excited to see them play. So it's one of those weird ones where like Kadeem Carey might be the Stampeders best player. Like, like there's a like valid argument and you, losing your best player is never a good thing. Mm-hmm. But also like, like we can show a little bit. Like we don't we we don't have to throw the season out. Now, I will say their passing game did not look good on Thursday. Um, I don't know how much of that was Jake. I don't know how much of that was the pressure that was coming from the Lions uh defensive line. Mm-hmm. Um I really I, I will say that they didn't even look particularly like they were trying to throw the ball downfield and do anything, get those big plays. I thought Trey Owens Dukes was the only receiver who really like flashed and caught my eye. Um, but I feel guilty saying that because to be perfectly honest with you, like, I don't think they tried to do anything with Reggie Bagleton. Like they were just giving him a little, Reggie Bagleton is your top receiver. I still mm-hmm. think he can be the best receiver in the league. Um, and I just don't think that they used him in the way that you'd expect them to use him when they're firing on all cylinders, which is him cutting across the middle, mm-hmm. getting behind the defensive backs and, and them going over, over the top to him. Now, why would that be? Do you think it's like just uh shifting to maybe different kind of systems? I don't think that they did it as much as I would have liked last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I tweeted this. It was over the weekend. Um, I had a drink or two. So I was watching 2019 Reggie Bagleton highlights, which just to tell you how cool Danny Austin really is. Um, but it was like, it was all of these like really dynamic him at full stride. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't see much of it last year. And I obviously didn't see it in week one. Now you needed a second or two to let him get downfield. And I, I do think Jake, was under a lot of pressure, mm-hmm. but it's just, it. I, I don't know why I just, I'm not saying that they're misusing him. I'm just saying that like the thing that I think makes him so dangerous, I'm not seeing um, it is week one. These guys barely played in the preseason. Mm-hmm. I think that it is something that Stampeders need to address going forward. Um, I think Julian's here. Um, is he just peering through the door? I don't know why he's welcome to come in. Yeah. Julian, if that's you, we're just going to talk about you if you don't come in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, yeah. Ooh. And I'm gonna call it now. Julian won the the shirt off between you two. I know it's always a fashion duel, but Trinidad and Tobago <laughs> hockey, get up. That is that is awesome. <laughs> so um, guys, I didn't realize I'd be thrown on uh, on air so soon. Actually, yeah, the camera wasn't quite up. So if you could just stand and like oh, yeah. give us a twirl, maybe. Yeah, that's an awesome know. shirt. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, Thank I have you. two full outfits because I'm hosting a different show after we finish recording this show. So right off camera, I have, but it's not as cool as. Gee, that. I wonder but, what that other show you're hosting. Uh, Live in the Fifty Five, hosted by Danny Austin, it's a CFL show. Um, that's what we call a. Yeah, we have Charleston Hughes on today. Um, but Julian, man, how you doing? I, I didn't see you 12 hours ago. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't see you 12 hours ago. No, I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, the week's been uh, filled with a lot of ups and downs, but uh, I'm here. Yeah, we I appreciate you being here because this has. We we let off the show um, talking about that. And I apologize if I cut you off there at all. Mm-hmm. I didn't mean to. But um, let's go back to that. Um, obviously, your shop, I don't think we need to go into too much, but did have a couple – couple of layoffs and then today we saw massive layoffs um at bell media uh 1300 people uh is really going to affect both news coverage and sports coverage in this country i know tsn 1260 uh the radio station edmonton has sort of made the most headlines um i'll be real with you some of the smartest people i'm not going to name them all because i don't want to miss anyone but some of the smartest people in canadian sports media are there um you know we all have a rivalry here in calgary with edmonton but that's an exceptional radio station that particularly when it comes to the Oilers, I think has done important journalism and has really kept some important conversations going. And they also have done a great job with the Elks, which I appreciate. I'm a regular guest or have been a regular guest and uh, I just think we're going to miss them and it sucks. And uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to say to it about it, but it's, it's tough. Uh, just, just strictly speaking with, uh, with Bell today, it's really tough and just sad just to, hear the news about the cuts and and hear about all these people's jobs being impacted, their lives being impacted. No one likes to see it. And uh, even if you see enough tweets over the years of stations being shuttered and being turned into different formats, you don't really get used to it. And uh, there's just something about this week's news, I guess, for both of those shops, I guess, uh, the athletic and, and bell where I don't know, I, at least personally for me, I feel, I feel a lot differently about the industry that I did 
maybe previously, and I feel a little bit more pessimistic than I normally would. And I can't imagine how other people thinking about this would be feeling as well, especially those who have been directly impacted by these cuts. So it's a, it's not a, it's not the, it's not the best news to start a Wednesday with. But um, you know, you just have to think about uh, if you're in a position where you could still contribute to the media business. You know, be thankful for that, I guess. And both of you guys are. We have all been through. Unfortunately, we've all been through cuts, um, and it uh, it never gets easier because you're seeing good people who are smart people who are good at their jobs, who through no fault of their own uh, no longer have those jobs, and there's nothing worse. Um, so I don't know. We are thinking about you. I don't know if you want to add anything, Kami, but as I said earlier in the show, to all of you know the people at Bell, um, we're thinking about you. If you need anything, hit us up. Absolutely. And I was just going to say earlier, like it does make us thankful, thankful to sponsors like Ski Seller Snowboard, who are bringing Julian in with us today. But oh, yeah. I mean, we all come from uh, Danny comes from the print side. I'm predominantly the TV side. Julian, you're doing a lot of the digital and podcasting side for you guys. Yeah, Julian uh, does everything. Yeah, Julian does do everything. But that was kind of my question. Do you feel like it's possible to make a living in sports media without doing everything? Or can you really be at one company now or one shop i don't know if you yeah i don't know if you could do that in canada i think if and even in the united states now where we're seeing all of these media people making all of millions of dollars like the pat mcafees of the world like and even those guys like they did it off of venturing into digital media and newer spaces and going about media in a non-traditional way i just find in in canada now it's so much more difficult to say that you want to dominate this one particular space and be the person in one space and just hope you can survive off that. Like, I I, I mean, I, I look at my career. I look at Chris Johnston, who I, I do his show. That's a guy who, after his contract was up at Sportsnet, found himself doing a bunch of different gigs with TSN, North Star Bets. Sometimes his work is up in the Toronto Star. Like, he's he's got many different bosses. And I think if you're in a position where you have enough of a platform you can put yourself in a position to do that. I mean, I even think of a guy like Jason Greger today, who was definitely among the casualties at, at Edmonton 1260, who had his own show, but he also hosts the Daily Faceoff podcast. Like, I, I think if you're in this game now, you can't just survive off of one particular platform, especially if it's in the traditional media space. I mean, we're seeing more, I mean, the Nation Network, well, Bard Burner, I wanted to bring it up. Of, yeah, like, 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 like we're going to see more and more of that yes dpn my shop like we're gonna see more and more of people betting on themselves and saying hey we're gonna still provide that platform but we're gonna reach out to other sponsors to kind of feel that money in and, and see if we can get viewers to to follow us like it's such a weird Oops. space it's why i wanted to get in business with the nation network flatly is because i think it's actually growing and it's building something and i think there's so much in media that is contracting contracting contract, contracting and like that can be really hard um, you know, just feeling like it always is getting worse. So I, you know, I, I've been really impressed with what was happening here and that's why we've launched this, you know, we, we, I'm trying live from the 55 and, mm -hmm. and all that. And it, it's amazing. Um, and the thing that I think people don't always get is that like how hard it actually is because, you know, you, you bring up a guy like Pat McAfee. Well, the difference there is scale. And the difference is that if you are doing a Canadian sports podcast, the reality is there are what 35 million of us here in Canada. Um, and there are over 300 million Americans. There's just going to be more opportunity for revenue and for money. So it's, it is a risk. And I think that the people who are doing it are, I mean, honestly, like I support every one of them, whether it's, you know, whether it's your shop where we are here, I think it's like, it, it's what we need to see. And ultimately you're going to see the labor, the laborers begin to, you know, bet on themselves and take over because it's the, the only way forward. Um, I don't want to get too stuck on this. If there's anything else you guys want to add, feel free, but I don't, um, we're all, sad and it's on our minds and we will surely raise glasses over the next couple of days to um our colleagues there but um it's been like the funny thing is with all this going on is it's we there's also like one of the big calgary sports stories <laughs> um <laughs> how have you what's the reaction you've gotten i know we've both written about ryan huska being hired as as the flames um head coach it is something that i am very positive on i'm very bullish on i think it's a great hire um I've gotten, believe me, more people emailing me telling me that I'm a soft snowflake and um, I'm what's wrong with the world because I think that going to your job and enjoying so it. So not is just somehow name redacted thing. telling you you're a snowflake. I'm not just name redacted. Don't call the flames a snowflake. Um, I think that's. A, by the way, I mean I don't. I'm not gonna. You know what? Like, I might as well open the door. What a joke to say that. Like, just because uh, a coach 
was not the right fit for a particular group of guys and might not have gone about things a certain way that, you know, certain players of a newer generation would like to have. And they just kind of call them snowflakes. I can understand if you want to make the point that the onus is on the players now. And I think it should be on the players, the guys like Jonathan Huberto, Nazem Kadri, Mackenzie Weger to, you know, take over this team and try to bring them to another level, depending on what that team looks like. And I understand with Elias Leno, that changes a bunch of things. But to go to a point where you're just going to call them snowflakes, I think that's an absolute joke. So I know I'm not calling out this person by name, and I don't know if that makes me a joke, but like whatever. No, I mean, I, I, prefer, I would prefer you didn't for obvious reasons. But yeah, there was a Well, I'm not going to get you in trouble. Yeah. If, it, if anything, if I'm going to get in trouble, fine. You can, you can hit me up on my email, call me, whatever. I don't care. Like, well, it, yeah. I just think it's an absolute joke the way that they're wording that point. Yeah, I think, look, the fact that there were issues with Daryl Sutter in the Flames locker room, um, I think some of those issues may have run deep. I don't know. I'm not saying Daryl Sutter's a bad dude. I'm not saying, like, I'm I'm refraining, but I think that, like, look, the fact that people came and said that this work environment did not bring out the best in me as a player. It's a legitimate criticism. It's, it's a, yes. it's a legit criticism. Um, and if you want to take that point and say that the players are soft and, and say that you're saying that there's snowflakes, like, I guess I just don't agree with that. Well, and Wes, I don't know if the story's up, but my colleague Wes Gilberton wrote a story. He spoke to Morgan Klimchuk. He spoke to all sorts of people from um, Ryan Huska's past. And the funny thing is they were like, this guy works harder and forces you to work harder than you've ever worked. Like the, the idea that he is somehow some soft coach, like, no, it's just that there's communication. And I'm sorry, like, if you remember when Huberto was put back on the left wing, we asked him like, oh, when did you find out? And he was like, it was on the whiteboard. We were like, oh, you, Daryl didn't tell you? And he was like, no. And like kind of smiled. And like, it, 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 I think like it's not, oh, who was harder, who was not. It may be communication. It may actually be giving the players more of a voice, um, having a captain. Ryan Huska talked about how important getting that captain decision was because he needs the captain to relay what he's saying to the players. And then he needs the captain to relay honestly what the players are trying to get across to him because he can't talk to every player every day. Like it's, it's, it's that stuff that I think is just so important. And it just completely misses the point to say that these players somehow were soft because what happened last season didn't work and was not a happy work environment. And I, I just like, it affects people, man. Like you can do as much work as you can and you can relate that to hockey players. You can relate that to journalists. You can relate that to medical professionals if you're not working in a good environment, how are you going to put together good work? Or how are you going to care about the work that you put together? Like, I don't know. There's a lot of faults we can point to at the Flames season last year. We've done that for weeks, months on end. Yeah. But I, I think the culture of that place needed a shakeup. And I think just to kind of actually get to the original question you're going to ask, it seems as if uh some people are or at least some fans seem to be responding a little well with with ryan huska being hired i see a small faction of people who are maybe a bit worried that because he was under daryl sutter maybe some of that era could still continue on but also this is a person who was under jeff ward it was also under bill mm -hmm. peters he's been under a bunch of different coaches and he's gotten all that <laughs> experience frankly an absurd number of coaches it's ridiculous <laughs> right um and he still stuck around and, and the flames were able to to promote him, uh, I, I put out a, a, a survey today on The Athletic, uh, an off-season survey, and just looking at the really early results, it seems as if they're pretty favorable for, for Ryan Huska being hired as well as Craig Connor. So, yeah. Well, Since you plugged it, I will also just uh, plug it as well. Uh, Flames Nation has chucked up their uh, off-season fan survey poll, so go check that out. and uh, Absolutely. Fill it's okay out. Let's know where surveys. you're at, fans. <laughs> it's okay to do two surveys. <laughs> And it's, I oh, mean, yeah. like, like, we're just kind of going off the dome here, but it's like interesting what you mentioned, where it's like, oh, that concern about him having like served under Dale. It's like, I didn't even, I, I didn't feel the need to question it in, in any of my writing or anything, but like, there was like, oh, we're doing this major culture change, everything's changing. And then they promoted two internal candidates to GM and head coach. Like, I can see if people wanted to make the argument that, like, you said you wanted a big culture change, but what have you actually changed here? It's just that I'm, like, and this is the hard part, and sometimes I have to remember when I'm doing my writing mm -hmm. that, like, you know, I'm, I'm paid to ultimately observe and then report on what I observe. And why do I think there's a culture change? Because I've been there in the room. I've been there talking to Craig Conroy after the press conference. Well, and it's a recipe. Him. Literally, yeah. like, what is recipe for success you could have all of the same ingredients but if things aren't there in like the right amounts mm -hmm. or to translate to real life the same amount of responsibilities in some cases that can change everything no that's absolutely that's 100 correct i agree um 
and yeah, I mean, I, I because to be honest, I was getting ready for this this show. They ha- the barn burner guys had Husk on right yeah, before for this morning. Like, yeah. and, like I am really looking forward to watching that. But at the very least, I mean, he he seems to say the right things. <laughs> like like in terms of the actual, what is he going to to change in terms of the style and, and system of play? I mean, I, I haven't been able to do a ton of reporting on that at all. But he like I expected him to come in and say, oh, you know. It's all about better shot creation, better better opportunity creation, and instead he actually focused on like it's it's actually about preventing. Like it was a very it was completely different. He was like it's it's the sh- opportunities were given up, which is a different lens than I necessarily have like used because we talked so much about Markstrom underperforming. We talked so much about how oh they're getting forty shots, but they're all from the outside. And to hear him actually sort of pinpoint that he didn't like what they were doing defensively. That's was, really interesting, considering that like if you look at their I mean, not too in deep of defensive metrics, but like this is a team that had a solid penalty kill, and it was like like, like in the top ten, I want to say, maybe, maybe no lower than like six. I'm trying to remember, but like even the chances against that they allowed, they were among the fewest in the league. So I, I think that's good on 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 Ryan to point out the fact that maybe the chances that we're allowing that the team is allowing, that's that's a problem. And and I mean, maybe if Jacob Markstrom played at a slightly higher level. We don't talk about that, but that is a really interesting thing to for Ryan to focus on. But at the same time, for me, like I kind of figured that with Ryan staying around, the defensive side would more or less be okay, and they would shore up that side and figure out what they would need to do. I think the offense is the biggest question mark for me. Greg Conroy has made the point that he wants a team that can play sound defensively and have that structure in the back, but he wants those guys on the offense to play with creativity. And... While I don't doubt that Ryan Huska could be that bench boss to kind of ensure that both sides work, they are going to need someone whose focus is that. Frank Cervalli saying that uh, Kirk Muller's probably not going to be back with the team, right? And that seems like that's my gut. Yeah, I, I, I figured no that was that too. I figured that like if they were going to keep him, maybe they would have said something. But that my inclination was that he wasn't going to come back, and that honestly, I mean, Kirk's a nice guy. But considering how mid the power play was, it dropped from the year previous to last season. They needed a change there. You can't have all those new players and guys like Huberto, who we know can be dynamic as a passer. And and if you keep Elias Lindholm, we'll see how that goes. But also the other offensive players that they have and just not generate great chances and not show any creativity in the offensive end. Like the most creativity we saw from them all year last season was that play in preseason where Jonathan Huberto did a little spin around along the wall and then had Toffoli and Lindholm going up with him? Like we've looked at well, that. And then we, we thought, had fans freaking out about uh, yeah. anytime Huberto took so much as half a spin the rest of the season. Like, come on! Like, I, I, I think whoever takes that mantle on the coaching staff, whether they look at any of whether it's Mitch Love for whatever reason, or if it's. Uh, any of the other finalists that uh, were up for the job or any of the other names that have been rumored to be in for that job, I think there should be a lot of attention placed on that person because I think Ryan Huska is a defensive person. He's, I think he's already proven that he's good on that end of the ice. Whoever is in charge of the power play, whoever's in charge of the offense, they have a lot of responsibility in terms of getting the best out of this, out of this team. Well, now we know what the next – number one point of business is, and that is the future of Elias Lindholm. I know that uh, Connie has talked to players to see what they thought about Huska as part of the hiring process. Uh, Julian, have you heard anything about whether uh, Lindholm was one of those players consulted and whether this is going to move the needle and whether he decides to uh, re-up or whether the Flames will be dishing him? Well, the, the, at the press conference, uh, Lindholm was brought up and, and Ryan Huska flat out said, like, hey, I spoke to him Monday morning. Mm-hmm. And that also, before the team has even stepped onto the ice, Ryan Huska has to play the role of salesman, essentially. He has to talk to all those UFAs, and depending on how they want to go about it in terms of which guys they want to keep, which guys they want to trade, Ryan Huska has to do the selling job to everyone else to be like, hey, this environment is going to change, and it's worth it to keep you around in order for us to be a contender. And I also think, like, I don't know how often this happens, but, like, there are also none of those other decisions can be made until you know what what's happening with Lindholm. hundred percent. If you know he's the biggest domino, he's the biggest domino. And it's like, Oh, we want to make a decision on Tanav on Hannafin or whatever. If Lindholm is back, you basically are given a green light to continue with this, which is trying to go for it. Whether you, whether people believe that they are actually in the mix or not, I, I like, I'm not weighing in on that just now. I'm sure 
in the next half hour, I will. But if he's not and he's gone, I, I am of the belief that they're not going to make the same type of move that they made with Kachuk and try to bring current players. They're going to have to get younger at the very least, which means that then, yeah, you probably are looking at the Tanevs and, and potentially even the Hannafins and, and all of those guys. But until you know what's happening with Lindholm, like there's not even really any point in us going through a list and saying, who do you keep? Who do you not? Because it all depends on Lindholm. I agree. I agree. I think considering that, consider the importance of a player like Elias Lindholm. Yeah, you can't really, he, you have to, depending on how, where you slide it with him, like once that's dealt with, then you could go through everything else. I still think that if the Flames keep him, I, like I get people are a little bit apprehensive about the contract and then the money that he might get. We did a story the other day where, uh, according to Evolving Hockey, he kind of projects out to like an eight-year, 8.7 mil deal. Like if that's a, a player who can, you know, as Conroy kind of listed out as well, that as his as he gets older, his game will still be pretty good. I don't mind necessarily shelling out that money. I mean, if it's over, if it's over nine million, you get a little bit worried. If you keep it under nine million, that could still be a pretty good contract to say. It's just that window that you have, you know, maybe another year, maybe another two years. And if you at a point where you have to flip away Linholm, I, I also see where Danny's saying too. You got to find a way to get younger. You got to find a way to get some younger players. You got to find a way to get some draft picks out of that. Yep. It's just at the same time, you you have Huberto and and Uyghur in that kind of window where they're they're at their best, and you have to also find a way to play through that too. It's not as if they're they're much younger, and you could say, you know what, we can wait it out a couple more years before we get to that point. But you're you're at a point now where those guys are are, are supposed to be at their best, and you have to maximize that window before you get to a point where they're 33, 34, 35, and you don't have them at their best. Maybe you have other players in that core who can uplift them, but you also have to think about what you have with them right now too. So I, I want to follow up on like a million things that you just Oh, dude, actually, there's not... a bunch of stuff we should talk about with this. <laughs> um, and like, I actually don't mean follow up in terms of arguing because I agree with with most of it. If you are Elias Lindholm's agent, yes. and oh, man, I, I thought that I had the stats up right here. It didn't quite work out. So we're just going to... Kind of funny, kind of funny that... Uh, for the second straight year in a row, uh, the Calgary Flames are going to have to do some kind of big money move with Craig Oster. <laughs> um, it's really okay. funny. Is it funny? It is kind of funny if for me. You are, if you are Elias Lindholm. I'm a very sad looking Flames fan. Just oh. um, here. Sorry, sad looking Flames fan. If you are Elias Lindholm, his agent, if you are walking into these negotiations and saying, cool, cool, Craig Conroy, I'm, I'm open to negotiating. You're not saying... I'm the number one center. Why is Jonathan Huberto getting paid more than me? You're not asking for at least, like, it's got to be close to what Huberto's getting. I don't you? know if you, you're pricing yourself out at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think. I'm not saying the Flames would give it to him, but, like, isn't that, like, isn't that yeah. your starting point? I mean, negotiations go that way. And mm -hmm. then you, if you're the Flames, maybe you counter with a lesser offer, and then you find a way to meet in the middle. But if you look at players that are comparable to Elias Lindholm in a situation, Again, going back to the article we put together, uh, myself and Shana Goldman, the closest comparable is Bo Horvat. And Bo Horvat is making eight and a half million dollars. So if you're starting from a point where you're saying 10, I mean, you're obviously trying to get on the higher end of things, but that's slightly unrealistic in terms of of, uh, of an asking price. Let's be real here. But just because a player, just because, and, and fans should keep this in mind too, just because it's out there that a player wants x amount of dollars that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to stand firm on that money negotiations have to happen and sometimes you could find a way to meet in the middle so if it somehow gets leaked out there that like elias lindholm wants like 9.75 mil or something like it doesn't have to be 9.75 mil no i mean that's Look, I don't negotiate very often, to be perfectly honest with you. But like, that's you my, should negotiate. That's, that's, my, under, you should, that's my understanding and, of how negotiations go. And Lin, and Lin <laughs> should be asking for more money. I get it. Like, you know, you you're a number one center. You've scored forty goals. Uh, you're you've been a Selkie finalist before. You're a great two way center. You are essentially, if the team keeps you, you keep whatever contention window they have. But if if if, if you get if you get moved. Who knows what the team's going to end up doing? Like, if you're Elias Lindholm, you do hold some leverage in all this, and you should play it. You hold a advantage. lot of leverage. You hold a ton of leverage in the situation. Especially because Absolutely. you should play I, up to it. Not because Conroy has come out and said it. I think whether he said it publicly or not has nothing to do with it, but because we know that the Flames are not willing to allow what happened with Gaudreau 
to happen with Lindholm. He said that, and he also yeah. said Lindholm is a player you build around. If you're Elias Lindholm in his camp, you already know what the Flames wanted. Exactly. So I, I'm not saying if I'm the Flames, I would give him 10, but it's why I walk in and I'm like, give me 10. You see as a starting point. This, this, you guys want to get this done quickly? You guys want to know what's happening with, with me before you make the decisions on everyone else? I'm the big domino to fall, which is, I mean, it's been reported that, you know, they want to get a sort of have an answer by the draft. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, that, I mean, that makes perfect sense. Makes perfect like, sense. I mean, I get that was out there, but like, good luck trying to move on from Elias Lindholm, like at the start of free agency, you know, after yeah. all the madness from the draft has happened. Yep. It's the, it's the time to do it. So it is like, we are going to know by then. Mm -hmm. That's just facts. Um, and we'll see. I mean, I am of the opinion that they're like if you want if I was guessing, it just feels I, I was there for that press conference. It, it just feels like that home is not going to be here next season. It's tough to say. I, it's it's really it's impossible. Tough to we say. don't know. We don't right. know. Maybe he does want to stay. I, I I do think, just personally speaking, I'd like to think that the changes that have been done in the front office over the last few weeks definitely will have a bearing on whether or not he wants to stay. Whether or not it actually makes a difference, who knows? But let's not discount the fact that having Ryan Huska and Craig Conroy in charge of things now uh, has to play a role in what Elias Lindholm might be feeling. But, you know, maybe you look at maybe he looks at how this last year went with some of the new line mates and he thinks, OK, you know what? Maybe it's not going to get any better for me in this market. Maybe I have to go somewhere else. I mean, it's what Backlund said, right? And then, That's what Michael I mean, Backlund said, yes. Lindholm's 28, turning 29. He's not quite as old as Backlund. But if you're realistically, this contract is going to take you pretty close to the end of your career. Can I say something about Michael Backlund that will probably piss a lot of people off here? I know what you're going to say, but I want you to say it. I think now's the time to move on from Michael Backlund. I understand that a lot of people think of him as a captain, and, and they see him as the guy with the C. But I see a guy who has done so many great things for this organization, has done so many great things in the city of Calgary. There might not be any better time to move on from him than right now. He's coming off his best season as a pro. He is a player who could contribute to a contending team in a depth role as a third line center. And if you're in a position where, you know what, he says, you know what, I would like to move on and go somewhere else. You find that deal and you make it work. Even if it means you're just getting like a B-level prospect and a draft pick. I think now is the absolute best time to do it. I think it can be win-win. And and I'm not a, saying a you, should, you should actually, I'm, I, look, I get I'm, I'm saying that, but like, I, I think he's a great person to deal with. And that's no shade on him as a person or a character or anything like that. Like, I, a I, player. I, he's I mean, a great he's player. He's, he's really good for this organization. I just think if you're thinking of the free agents that you have and you're thinking of whatever capital you can get and maximizing your assets. I think now's the time to make that move for Michael Backlund. And again, I realize it's a very polarizing opinion to say because of what he means to the organization, but I think you have to think about it. No, I, I don't think, think fans would be mad if he went to go chase a cup. No, no, I don't think anyone would be. begrudge him of that. But another point I'll make about Elias Lindholm, like we do need to keep in mind. Uh, we know Johnny Goudreau, like the big conversation was whether he was going to try to go close to home. Lindholm is also in a position where, he has a partner. He has a very young child yep. now. That has to be a, a factor in the decision as well. Hundred percent. I mean, yeah. quality of. I mean, we we don't think about this enough when we think about players and their decisions. Like they're human beings who have families and lives, and they want to get the most amount of money so they could be financially secure for generations, and they want to be in ideal markets where they can raise their children. And if you're Elias Lindholm and and the family, you think about whether or not Calgary is a viable place for you to raise your family. It very well could be. I mean, I, I haven't, I mean, I'm not in the same position as Elias Lindholm, but it's a great city. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in this market who have families and, and, and have beautiful houses here who think it's a great place to be. Elias Lindholm might have different priorities. Well, I know the back ones love it here. Yeah, absolutely. Especially like for their kids too. Like, I, I mean, I was talking to Frida once and she said like, in a way, like the kids do have more, ties and roots to Canada when they go back to Sweden like they have their their family for sure but their friends and stuff are here so they're like you know hanging with the the kids of their parents friends so there's that part for them that, like they've just been here longer I will, yeah. I will say with Backman quickly I, I to, to build off what you guys are saying I think that there is an in, intangible value in in that particular situation being seen by the league as being an organization that does right by their player. And I think that if Backlund wants, does want to leave or then what does want to go chase a cup as there are 
literally hockey reasons to do it, but I also think it sends a good message. However, I think that if Backlund says, look, I've spent my whole career, I've reconsidered, I love Craig, I love Ryan Huska, I'd like to stay, I also think that there's a value in saying, hey, if you're a loyal servant, you're okay. a loyal player, I think that they're like, we'll, we'll do right for you, we'll keep you around, we'll give you that contract. I think that they're like, I think that there's two sides to it. And I do think I that think Backlund so gets a say in it and that's important. Um, but like everything we're saying, like, oh, but that is the exact life. fork that Brad ran into with Gio. Yeah. Wanting I, to do right by someone that he really cared about and knowing that in the end of the day, he just could not do it. I know the shoe's kind of on the other foot now and it's the players, it's Bax who gets to kind of make that decision about his future. But there's a certain point where you can't just say like, yeah, we're going to try to do, do right by this person. Those are the difficult decisions. It's a business, decisions that it's a business at the end of the years. day, right? This is a tough off season. I mean, if you're Craig Conroy, man, this is your first off season as a general manager of an NHL team. And you have to deal with all these pending free agents for next year. This is not an easy job to deal with, but, but Cammy's right. Like, Oh, you, you can only use the whole doing right by people. You could still do it even if they leave, but like, you can't always let emotions get to a point where you say, you know what, maybe got to find a way to keep this guy when it might not necessarily be the right thing. You know, well, imagine, you might- imagine what Michael Stone's feeling right now. Michael Stone is another guy who's supposed to be a free agent this summer who made it very clear to all of us that he wants to stay and that his family has roots here. I wonder what his summer is going to be like. Yeah. I mean, I assume he's back here at the end of the summer, but I don't know how they're going to make it work. Oh, like a one-year deal? Yeah. Do you sign an AHL deal? Do you just let him go? I feel like he'd still do the A deal. I, I think he I, – I, I get the sense that if he wants to be in Calgary that bad, he might consider it. It's also or you sign on a PTO in the offseason. We talked about the dominoes dropping. Like, we also have to see what happens with Tana. We have to see what mm-hmm. happens with Hannafin. We have to see – Shillington has to be back, right? Like, yeah. there's – like, they could have a spot for him. And, and this is something that I know that we have discussed, but, like – Seem doesn't have a ton of defensive prospects just coming up. Nope. They let Valamaki walk for absolutely nothing. Yeah, we talked um, about that. They traded away Mackey. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I don't think we talked about it on air. I think we talked about it. We talked about it over in, in 12 hours. Uh, ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is, uh, Jamie Poirier has a lot of offensive upside, but still there's a lot of work that so does need to be done, done on the defensive, defensive end of things. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But I, I still think there's a lot of promise for him. And, mm-hmm. uh, Maybe in a year, you know, he ends up being a seventh defenseman to start. But you're right. I think in terms of – we didn't even mention, like, Yan Kuznetsov or Ilya mm-hmm. Solovoyov or, or any of the other defenders they might have in that with the Wranglers. But, like, yeah, there is a there is a void there. And I think that's why a lot of fans, when they look at the draft, they, they think, okay, well, yes, you want to get best player available. But there's a reason why a lot – some fans want guys like uh, Axel Sandin Polika at 16, mm-hmm. right? Like, they want that side of their prospect pool solidified. I mean, well, I think the funniest example of that is if we go back to, oh gosh, was it the 2013 draft when Oilers fans are just screaming, get us a defenseman, please. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. nail Yakupov. Did you um, see, uh, <laughs> not to sidetrack, there was a tweet that we saw yesterday. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, Mike Gould put it up. Uh, the Oilers had the number one overall pick in 2015, 2010, 2011. There's another year I'm missing. But the second overall picks in each of those drafts where the Oilers pick first have all won a Stanley Cup. Yeah. That's insane. It's insane. That's it's hilarious. It's, it's Wait, a, those years aren't right because they were all three in a row. I'm missing – I'm probably mangling the years, but 2015 yeah. is very obvious because Jack the, Eichel yeah. won. Uh, whoever was mm-hmm. behind Neil Yakupov, Ryan Murray, that mm-hmm. draft year, that's 2012. Uh, Taylor Hall, there was the Hall Sagan year. Sagan yeah. won a cup. Yeah. And the one player that I'm missing is I'm missing a guy. We did this last night. We did this last night and I'm missing a guy. I, I pulled up a quiz of the top five draft picks 2010 to present in each year, and I'm gonna see if I can figure it out myself. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, so you guys talk. I'm gonna figure it out. I'm so let's you, you know no Googling. I'm sure we will before we're done here go back to a little bit to the, the flame stuff it's just again my difficulty with talking about what the flame summer looks like is a, as i said i just think that until you know what is happening with Lindholm, you don't know what you're doing with the other six um yeah, i agree i don't know if i think that's true of all six but for the sake of clarity and simplicity of argument i will say with the other six but it makes it hard to talk about that's just the reality like uh, we can say okay well if lynn has gone it's probably more interesting to talk about if lynn home doesn't want to be here because then we're talking about well is it actually like can you do a rebuild a quick rebuild where you just get a ton of assets and try 
yes, you're going to have Cadre and Huberto on the books and Uyghur, but like over the next couple of years, you might not get that number one overall pick, but look, it's not like every team that wins the Stanley Cup has a bunch of number one overall picks. Um, so you might just be able to get a ton of young assets and in three or four years be a contender again while you still have Huberto and Cadre under contract. Or get, or get a first round pick in this year's draft. Exactly. Like I get that. Like we, we saw a couple of weeks ago, everyone lost their minds about the idea of Lindholm getting flipped for like a third for the third overall pick, which I don't see that happening, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. But if you are the Calgary Flames and you have Lindholm and he wants out, and a team like Toronto or Colorado or any of those teams that are kind of in that mushy middle to the bottom, they're saying, "Hey, we want to contend, and we need a center that's going to get us there," and they're willing to offload a first round pick to do it. I, you think about it. I think you have to think about it. You have to absolutely think about it. I mean, yeah. you. I, mean, I don't know if it's a situation where you're packaging your own first round pick to move up or move somewhere else in the draft order. But like, if you're the Calgary Flames and you come out of this draft class with like two first round picks, I mean, doesn't that also kind of help a whole rebuild on the fly? Like, that's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. They have a first. They have a third. They have some other picks later in the draft, but they don't have a second this year. Or do they not have a second? Okay. Uh, or no, no, I messed that up. They have a first. They have a second. They don't have a third. But like, still, like it's. Add more draft capital. There's nothing wrong with that. No. And that, I mean, that's the direction that I would go. But I do know that there are a ton of people out there who just think that they ultimately, with the guys they have, are too good to really bottom out. And my argument would be that you don't actually need to bottom out to rebuild. Um, you watch you watch the Vegas Golden Knights win the Stanley Cup. Yeah. How are you feeling about it? It's one of those weird ones where it seems like there's people who are just very conflicted in the hockey world about seeing them win a cup. I don't know why people should feel conflicted about it. They built a team. They made good trades. They took advantage of general managers who effectively were sleeping at the wheel on some of their players. Let's look at the uh, recent playoff MVP and Jonathan Marchasso, who was basically given away by the Florida Panthers. Um, first undrafted player to win playoff MVP since. Oh, I have no idea. Wayne Gretzky. There you go. There we go. What? Wayne Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky was never an NHL draft pick. Wait, so like his by his last cup? Well, like he won, he won. I don't know when he won his last like con Smythe or whatever. But like, in ter- but like John. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, MVP. Yeah, yeah. Playoff okay, MVP. that was like who won? Uh... No, no, no. <laughs> like, but like, yeah, it, it's kind of weird. Okay, there we go. There we go. Kind of weird. It's like a the weird wheels are turning thing. now. The wheels but, are turning now. Yeah, the we- it's a weird technical thing, but like still. But all that to say, like I, I think Vegas and the fact that they were able to build a winner. And it took them six seasons to do it is is insane. And there's a lot of a lot of podcasters and media people who are wondering if this is going to inspire GMs to just go for it and make these these big trades, offloading their assets to get these sure things as well, players. The Flames. I mean, I you know, I, I was around for when they were heavily rumored to be in on Mark Stone. Mm-hmm. J- Eichel. There was yeah. a rumor about Jack Eichel yeah. when, when that was going on. Yeah. Um, and I, to be honest, I do believe that that's because Tree Living was on the phone on both guys. I think Stone was a lot closer. But and then you see those guys, and it's like, huh, huh. I mean, in the NBA, it's all about acquiring as many draft assets as you can to basically be ready to swing the deal when the star becomes available. What happens, right? Like, and that's there's an argument that Vegas and luck. I get that the whole way that Vegas came into the league set them up for success. On a certain level. Which is ironic because we all looked at their draft and we thought, okay, well, they're just going to suck. Mm-hmm. How many people looked at that draft that Vegas did and thought, oh, yeah, well, they're set up for success? How many people genuinely thought that? Yeah. There's the benefit of hindsight on that. I can't think of too many people who looked at that draft and thought, okay, man, Vegas Golden Knights are going to be this really good team. Mm-hmm. Maybe the rules are different. Maybe some things are, you know, Maybe they'll, they won't be as bad as, I don't know, the Atlanta Thrashers in their first year. But, like, I can't think of anyone without, all right, man, they're built for success. They're going to be this, like, cup contending team in, like, year one. Yeah. No one thought that. No. And and there is, they, like, it oversimplifies things to in any way say, oh, well, like, look. I mean, the NHL changed the rules for Seattle to avoid what happened happening. Again. We were all wrong mm-hmm. on Seattle, too. Yeah. We were mm-hmm. all wrong on Seattle, too. We all thought that. They, what were they doing? Why are they moving around these guys? Why are they getting these players? They turned themselves into a well-balanced team that upset the reigning cup champions and got to round two. So here's the question I have for you guys now. Yes. The teams that have not won a Stanley Cup. Vancouver, technicality. Yes. I count the millionaires personally. Right, that's fair. Canucks, okay. Coyotes, Sharks, Jets, Wild Predators, Blue Jackets, Sabres, Panthers, and of course the Kraken. 
who is the next team out of those to win the Stanley Cup. Are you counting the Senators' Cups, too? Like the 1900s or whatever? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was. Do you mind? And I actually don't think this is bad podcasting. I think that it helps for us to hear it twice. Can you repeat it, please? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Canucks. Okay. Coyotes. I'm kind of going by division here. Okay. Sharks. Okay, so we're ruling out the Coyotes and Sharks. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna not, like I have do... the list here. I'm gonna yeah. strike them. So you're striking coyotes and sharks. You don't think it's happening? Wait, I... So wait, so we're saying the next cup winner of the teams who have of these won ones. Yet. I'm not saying they're gonna yes. take it next year. Yeah. Of these teams, who do you see getting there first now? Okay, okay. okay. I All right. So you just X'd out the sharks and the jet or the coyotes and the sharks. We got the Jets, the Wild, Predators, Blue Jackets. Okay, I definitely don't have the Jets winning the next cup. I think they're gonna have to blow it up. In part because they just have the worst group of people. <laughs> I still, I still want to believe in the Minnesota Wild, but they're starting to get to that Winnipeg Jets territory where I keep believing in them and they keep letting me down. Julian yeah. has struck out the Wild. All right, Blue Jackets, Sabers. <laughs> okay, Panthers. Strike out the Blue Jackets. Yeah, the Sabers are are yeah. fun. The Sabers are interesting. They're really interesting to me. I really hope they make the playoffs next season. With the right years. with think- the right moves, that team could in the next five years be in the mix. I mean, but also like look at the core of players like Rasmus Dahlin, Tage Thompson. That's what I mean. That's I don't think they're ready. Cool I think they'll have Devin Levi and goal. Yeah. Like they got some, they got something there. Yeah. So we are not striking the Sabers off. No, the we're not. Striking we're the keeping Sabres them on. Off. And um, I didn't mean to strike the wild off. I'm just saying, like they're 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 getting on my nerves. You still, all right? You still don't think even if Columbus gets healthy, even with the draft picks ahead, Columbus, is, you're still willing to strike I'm them. Willing, okay, ahead I'm, of the wild. No, hold on. The Columbus Blue Jackets, to me right now, I get they hired Mike Babcock. I get they got Ivan Provorov. The Columbus Blue Jackets, to me, are not better. Carolina, they're not better than the Rangers. They're I'm not, not asking against them, though. I'm asking against these other teams. You Maybe. still think with all that, with like Sillinger, with Kent Johnson, they have Damon Severson now, you still think that the Blue Jackets are that much further behind some of these other teams. We are a Calgary-based podcast, and I personally am not going to go on record in this market. I'm sorry, there's also the this young man named Jonathan Jackets. Gaudreau. I'm not doing it. I'm <laughs> trying to get people to like me, to watch my shows. I can't I can't be picking Jonathan Gaudreau's team, so... Me, I'm a new a, guy. I mean, like, I don't. I mean, you guys can pick. Them. You either you can either yeah. like me or not like me at this point. Whatever. Controversial. All right, the guys have ruled. They are striking the Blue Jackets. I don't think they're ready yet, man. And I think there are other teams on that list who I would think would be higher up for them to get a cup before the Blue Jackets are. Great city, by the way. Columbus. I under. I, I. It actually is. I actually. I like the the couple of days I was there last season. It was a nice city. Uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm not going to buy land and, and build a house there. Like I say, what? if they offered you the contract now, you wouldn't be. You <laughs> <laughs> used to give me the eight years. No, yeah. but it's, a, it's actually a nice city, and I get why some uh, former NHLers have have opted to retire there and hang out there. But like, it appears to have a great water park. Um, I didn't get to go to the water park. It was yeah. that is how Danny ranked cities. Um, no, it's to be honest, like when Johnny Gaudreau signed, I was like, I was like, so Columbus, eh? And I just looked up like what to do in Columbus, and the number one thing was like a really cool looking water park. And I don't like roller coasters, um, but I love a good log ride. You don't like roller um, coasters? No, I like a lazy river, and I love, love a log ride. So you're not um, a big Six Flags guy. All right, so this know? is the part where I'm actually going to rein you back in, Danny. Yeah. Okay. Can all we right. Continue okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, so you, you guys are keen <laughs> on the Sabers, Panthers, Senators. Kraken. I mean, I think Panthers is my number one there because they just lost in the Stanley Cup final. Yeah, but also like we see it so many times with teams that get got, to the they final. Got goalie. They had some goalie help there. They had some goalie magic through those first couple of rounds. They did, man. And Sergey Bobrovsky turned into a pumpkin, bro. And we don't know what I. We all hope that uh, Spencer Knight does the things he needs to do to get healthy and wish him all the best. But so. we don't quite know what the future is there right now and also some of those guys went through a grueling playoff run including one player in particular who got a broken sternum and is probably not going to play for another four or five months true my argument for them will be that this was a team that last season was a legitimate contender and fell like and fell pretty flat in the playoffs. They also so, had a different head coach, and I could think of two other players who were on that team who are no longer on that team. For sure. Um, I'm not saying it's the same team, but I'm saying like they are built to be contending right now. Like I don't view fair. this as being some like miracle run to the Stanley Cup Finals. Very fair. Um, I, I, I think that the Panthers are an elite NHL team. 
Um, so I, I, I honestly, like, I don't know that I expect them back next year. It's really hard to play that much hockey um, two years in a row. But I, I, I do think, like, this, it was, I think because of the way their regular season went, we viewed this as a surprise as one of those Cinderella stories when in fact, like this is probably closer to who the Panthers were than what they, their record appeared to be in the regular season. All right. Yeah. So disregarding the metropolitan cups, the old senators cups, the millionaires cups, se actually senators, like where are you guys at on the senators? I still think that they're, they're right on the cusp of being a good team. I still like the, the composition of players that they were able to assemble together. I know they're going to have to move on from Alex to it. It looks like, but, I've been saying that since the bubble season. I've just been ready for them to pop off, and it looked like at the end of the bubble season that fair. they might, but it's just... That's it true. <sighs> and, remember when everyone was so confident about the ownership situation? I mean, they're, they're going to get Michael Amlauer, but like, I don't know. I still feel like they have something. They could be a playoff team. The Atlantic I Division the is in more than the Senators right now, though. The Atlantic Division is insane. You have the Leafs, you have the Sabres who are trying to get in, you have the Red Wings who are trying to get in. The I like the way the Red Wings are building. I, I like I like the way that team's going. Like you literally like Boston, who probably won't be as good, but are not going to be a bad hockey team last year. The Leafs are still going to be good. So they're going to be a good team. Tampa's still going to be good. Yep. Florida, as I just said, I expect to be Stanley Cup contenders. And then behind that, you have, yeah, Buffalo, Ottawa, and Detroit, all of whom are are knocking on the door with like good young cores that you would hope that they will begin to make those moves to continue to acquire veteran players to complement them. So like that division is nuts. Okay. I, so I, I'm going to okay. strike them. I'll strike them based on that. So you guys have, uh, after that first pass through in terms of teams that have not won a modern Stanley cup, mm -hmm. not saying next year, not saying the year after that, but the teams that you guys think will be next, we have left the Canucks predators, Sabres, Panthers, and Kraken. Okay. I think my answer is going to end up being... Do we want to do a 3-2-1? Like, do we want to build from Ooh. third? Oh, that's a... Oh, so like a third place, a second place. Yeah. Huh? I thought you were going to say, well, you bet a 3-2-1. Right, I guess like, we have let's to... All say, let's all say the team. We're we have to... Up three. I thought you pick... meant like a weighted vote, and I'm like, I'm not going to do all that. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so I have Panthers as my number one. There's something about that Canucks team that I'm not sure about. I'm not gonna pick a I, Vancouver team. I'm just it's just like that core that's there. Patterson's so good. He's so good. He has the most underrated shot in the league. Uh and they have Quinn Hughes, who is so good as a defense. Huggy Bear, as the kids call him. They call him Huggy Bear? Yeah, it's a thing. He always looks like he needs a hug. They they have really nice pieces. It just they doesn't do. feel like the vision for the team makes a ton of sense. They also <laughs> completely mangled this past year. This is a team yeah. that should have put themselves in a position to get Connor Bedard. Instead, he now plays for the rival team. Yep. Doesn't make sense. And you know it's going to give Connor Bedard some soul rot. You just know that kid remembers exactly where he was when Alex Burroughs slayed the dragon. Yep. That um, first Chicago-Vancouver game... That first Chicago Vancouver <laughs> game. That's gonna be very fun. Um, so we're striking Vancouver. Yeah. Let's just I think I'm gonna strike though. Okay. I just they just I they I, I thought under after? Travis Green with the pieces that they have that maybe they're gonna be more competitive. I know Rick Tockett mm -hmm. is is changing that team around a little bit, or at mm -hmm. least it looked like they did last year. I'm not as sold on them as opposed to my number one pick, which is the Buffalo Sabres. All right. I feel like um I so we did this without one. saying it. I forget if I said this out loud. I did strike the Predators. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, we, yeah, we, no. we could strike them. Yeah. 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 So we have the Sabres, Panthers, closer. and Kraken, and I would go Sabres. Yeah. Go yeah. get them, Peyton I'm, Krebs. I'm Shout I'm out going. to Nashville, though, who you know started to try to rebuild, and they still almost made the playoffs anyway. Yeah. And I, I still think maybe after this next year, you know, they'll, they'll try to start it for real. But, mm -hmm. like, you know. Barry Trotz is running the show over there now. I'm really intrigued on what's going to come of that team. So I'm going to Florida. You guys are going to Buffalo. Yeah. That was a good. That was, that was a, a great exercise. exercise. Farewell, Seattle. Yeah. Um, Why well, Seattle, well, like, win a cup? I was, I'm very years. surprised that you guys were that. Because Seattle's going to draw aside to the, the, the Blue Jackets were that quick of a cast off. I just think those teams in front of them in their division over the next few years are still going to be really good. And I don't see them. All right. That's fair. But that's also, fair. that I. I still think that my Babcock hire is weird. I still think it's really weird. And I don't see them. I mean, I could I, I, I could totally be wrong. I've been wrong before. Mm -hmm. But, like, I don't think it's going to work out the way that they want to work out. It's very much a last gasp. Not to make that parallel, but, like, 
I could think of another general manager who was, a, who was in a situation where they ran through a bunch of coaches and they needed an old school guy to kind of get the most out of a team in the hopes of, you know, keeping their job alive. And how did that work out for that team? I also like if there is one thing that Daryl Sutter said repeatedly that I genuinely believe, and I'm saying this sincerely, it's that the only way to win a cup is to lose in the playoffs over and over again and learn the lessons and get better and build year over year. And I genuinely think that's true. Which yeah. is why, like Vegas went through that hundred mm-hmm. percent. I think that like, I think you, I mean, we saw it with Michael Backlund. I mean, again, I'm just kind of paraphrasing Sutter here, but he said, Oh, why did Backlund have his best year? Cause he elevated his game in the playoffs last year and understood the standard that he had to, that he could get to. He also had um, Elias Lindholm and Nazem Kadri as centers one and two. That's also true. That's very true. Yeah. Um, but I just think, like, when we do that type of exercise, for me, I'm going to pick the team that I has already lost a couple times in the playoffs. And I, I like – that's part of why I think I I like the Panthers on that list. Um, and Columbus, I just feel like me picking a 59-point team, like, man, they got some work to do. I grew up in Toronto. I'm technically sort of – like, the Leafs still own a very small, like, hidden part of my heart. I was there for the Babcock years. Pavcock's not that great. The only thing I just want to say <laughs> with regards to... I think to, feel like it was the Olympics that really uh, gave him maybe an inflated god status for a while. Yeah, maybe a little bit. And I will say it, 2014, I fell asleep during the gold medal game. Really? It wasn't that exciting. Oh. It's a shutout. Yeah, it was It that... was done. There was nothing. They they got their three goals and then they just lock it down. Carrie, Pl- Carrie Price played the that's best goal in the, the world. The women's final was more exciting than I mean, yeah, that's, there's no debate about that. It was infinitely more exciting. I remember where I was. The women's that. final was almost always more exciting it was insane i just want to just make this point because you're right florida does have that playoff experience in terms of the year they had with them in the president's trophy and what they went through uh this past year um i'm trying to think like how many other playoff series did they win before the president's trophy winning season yeah like honestly like none right they'd won yeah they didn't no they didn't have that Uh, not well at least not since uh the 96 run yeah like I think for we're seeing now with the unpredictability of of this sport and this league and how teams could just kind of catch fire and get it. Like what if the Buffalo Sabres have this wild year next season where they look really good and they win like two rounds? That changes everything in terms of how they're viewed and, and what their window. The New Jersey Devils were a team that were sort of knocking on the door. They got to round two. Their expectations have to change now, especially with some of the players that they have in terms of Timo Meyer, if they find a way to keep him or however that looks. Even then, like you have Jack Hughes, who's going to turn into a face in this league. All you need is like one good playoff run, and then all of your expectations change. 100% true. I will say, I feel like I'm harping on this a lot, like way more than I actually care about it. Mm. But if we're going to talk about losing in the playoffs, (laughs) there is a team that Danny wanted to strike real fast. That might have swept the Tampa Bay Lightning and then got thoroughly dismantled in the next round. <laughs> I'm not a Blue Jackets fan, I swear. I just think it's fun. <laughs> and on, oh, sorry, another side note, just before Danny gets a little, little ruffled. No, I'm not uh, ruffled. I'm already ruffled because I'm so sweaty. I cannot why are you describe, wearing that I cannot then? describe to you. This is not good why podcasting. Would you, why would you I, purposely wear clothes so, that would make you sweat? Like, well, let's just it was be cold outside. Fully it's open. hot in here. Yeah, yeah but like, cool you can outside. wear the jacket and like a cool t shirt underneath. My and then you whole thing is I'm hosting back to back shows. So I d- want to have different outfits. So, so that it doesn't look like I'm doing that. I'm trying to look like the white <laughs> oh. Cameron on this show. And then you, what are you going to look like on the other show? Well, to be fair, I couldn't find this jacket, and as it turns out, it was in the backseat of my car. It's really, I'm really happy we're not like high def and close. It's, it is filthy. I cannot wear this. Like it's so gross. So um, we got we got to go shopping. Then we got to go thrift shopping. You got to get I your mean, new I, jacket. Like I don't know if people you probably can't. why are you it's exposing like, the filth on your jacket? Because I'm bro. admitting it. We're at the point in the podcast. Bro. It's been an hour and forty five minutes. I still need to do an hour of CFL after this. This is where we're getting to, man. Damn. This is where we're at. I, Are you able to take Cammy a break won't stop this? talking about the Columbus Blue Jackets for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. This is spinning out of control. Um, this on is- a positive note, <laughs> on a positive note, Julian, you weren't here for this, but trust me, this is very important. Mm-hmm. Meyer and Juliet have followed the foot soldiers on TikTok. That's great. Yeah, good <laughs> yeah. for them. Um, I forgot we even had them on the show. I'm so sweaty. This white <laughs> t-shirt I'm never going to be able to wear again. <laughs> <laughs> did, did we did we uh shout out uh cammy for the u sports awards we did over the weekend? I, I, I think you should shout that, her out Thanks, again <laughs> yeah that was uh i got to keep it too i mean you, you wouldn't have kept it otherwise 
I mean, I've gotten RTDNAs before and, and I've only got them? to keep one of them. Really? I took a picture with one of them and then the station just took it right back and what? I never I mean they hung it on a wall somewhere. Is it, oh, wait, oh. I still have I was the Southern Alberta Curling Association's 2014 reporter of the year. Uh and I <laughs> 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 And I uh, did you put that on your. Did you put that as one of your prompts? It's on like your on. Profile? I have what I would describe as in my living room a decorative ladder, um, and it is displayed on my decorative ladder. That's cool. It's it's to be fair, it's not that cool a decorative ladder, um, <laughs> but I don't like I. I'm not gonna spend money to replace. Like you have one decorative ladder, you don't upgrade, right? You just kind of keep it as is. But yeah, it's, it's one does a decorative Rustic. ladder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, I have a uh, I have my Southern Alberta Curling Association's 2014 Media Person of the Curling Year Association. on display. Yeah, well next done. next to um, my replica Toronto Argonauts 2017 Grey Cup ring that they inexplicably gave me. Um, I just showed up at the stadium in Toronto and they were like, "Here you go, man!" Like, Great. And then the, now uh, the Argonauts <laughs> are trying to poach a reporter. <laughs> They weren't though. That's the weird thing. I would have listened. Um, He's gonna be the next one after Corey Mace. They're taking Corey oh, Mace. They're taking yeah, all those guys. Yeah. They're taking Danny too. We have and to then, keep the fifty-five podcast even. Okay. And then the okay, the Calgary Flames have re-signed forward Clark Bishop. Um, so sorry, I literally the press release came in and I was like, if they just re-signed Lindholm. Well, could you imagine that, if that happened while yeah. we were doing this breaking news? Um, I do like Clark Calgary. Bishop though, very solid. But um, yeah, and then I also have a 2019 Toronto Raptors replica championship ring that I spent like two hundred dollars on, um, that I wore to my birthday. If you guys remember that, um, oh, <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah, um, I'm gonna Ian Busby, who's my guest on the football show. Didn't send him the address. Doesn't know where he's going. So if you guys just want to vamp for a second, I'm going to take care of that. <laughs> oh man. Okay. All right. Cool. So, uh, Camel, we got we got to vamp for a couple of moments while Da figures his uh, ish out together. Well, no, we want to talk about. Uh, I mean, that's uh, exciting news for uh, Clark Bishop. I we love it. We that. love a kid from the Rock, Dawson Mercer. Who? I think the. Who? cool to see that he's getting that opportunity but actually yeah. one person we should kind of bring up uh that we have not brought up in all of the well i mean maybe we kind of touched on a little bit but we haven't really discussed enough what do you think mitch love's future is going to be i don't know i mean i think huska said that like they'll, they'll talk about him yes. joining the staff if that's what he wants i i really liked that huska said like it is we know that like the AHL is such a good league, but there are things that change even on the coaching side that maybe it would be good to get your feet wet that way. But also, uh, as we're talking about playoff experience, winning and losing, Clark Bishop is uh, still the only Wrangler to uh, to win a to win a Calder Cup. Yeah, but to, was, to your point about Mitch Love, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for him to follow the trajectory of Ryan Huska and Kale McLean before him, where you come from junior, then you work with the AHL team, and then you get bumped up to the NHL as an assistant. And the one question I have now is with no other coaching vacancy, unless there's a team I'm completely missing, like essentially you're either going to take an assistant job here in Calgary, or you're going to take an NHL assistant job somewhere else where you feel there is a, a, I guess a more direct pipeline for you to take mm -hmm. that job a lot sooner. And I can understand why he's been confident and, and you see the success he's had in the NHL, right? Two time reigning coach of the year. But at this point, I think the way into the NHL, he's going to graduate. He's going to be an NHL assistant to start, which is fine. Let him do that, and 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 if he, there's a place for him on the Flame staff, I think that's good to have in terms of continuity. We talk about how Ryan Huska has been able to work with guys like Andrew Mangiapane and Shillington. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, Mitch Love's a guy who has seen guys like Jacques Peltier and 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 Jeremy Poirier and other young players in the organization, and that would help with that too. So I think if you're the Flames, you're able to keep a guy like Mitch Love around, even if it does eventually mean that like you know maybe in a year or two you'll look for another job elsewhere, mm -hmm. especially if Ryan Huska's still working out in Calgary. Mm -hmm. I think it's still worth keeping him around. Oh, I definitely think it's worth keeping him around. I'd be shocked if they. You weren't. want as many good people as you can. Yeah, I, so, I yeah. think that they would. You want to hoard them. Like I and I, I will say that I think the obstacle there is more like, I don't know, I will say that people in Mitch Love's camp r r communicated with me that he like he they thought he he thought he was ready. They thought he was ready. He wanted. I don't blame job. him for thinking you're right? ready. Yeah, you're of course you would. You have the success you have in your reigning coach of the year mm -hmm. twice, like. Of course, you're going to feel confident, and yep. you're looking at all these other young teams in the NHL who are looking for young coaches to kind of, you know, build their teams around. Like a team, the team like Anaheim before they hired mm -hmm. like Greg Cronin, 
Yep. I don't know how much, uh, I don't know if Anaheim's had any interest in Mitch Love, but I can totally understand a guy like Mitch Love thinking like, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? It's time for me to graduate from the AHL and go straight to this young team that's still finding itself. Mm -hmm. Plus you're going to get Adam Fantilli second overall. So to like, live in Anaheim, lots of good water parks there. I believe that. Absolutely. <laughs> is that is that Disneyland or Disney World there? I don't. I always get that crossed up. I know. There's Universal Studios. Disneyland. 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 Thank Disneyland. you. Thank you. But yeah, all that to say, like, that is like a place I would envision Mitch Love going to if an NHL opportunity as a head coach was, you know, if if he, as, if he, if he was feeling as confident as, as he was, that's the type of place you're looking for as a head coaching. Game. So can I tell you a story about Anaheim? Sure. In 2018, I was still covering like the fights. So mm -hmm. I was, I went to LA for the UFC and I got out of the airplane and I went on a beautiful hike um, on one of the canyons in LA mm -hmm. and then went and I met all, all my buddies and we, we covered the fights and we were like, Hey, let's do the same hike. Instead of going like drinking to catch up, let's do a nice hike. Let's be healthy. Um, we got to drive out to Anaheim later in the day. And we drove, we, we got changed, put all our stuff. There are two videographers, myself, got did the hike, had the best time. We're like rapping along to like Drizzy songs. I just having the best time. And we got back in our car had been robbed and everything was gone. Like literally like $30,000 of camera gear, all of our laptops, um, people's like people's full suitcases, like people have no clothing. Um, I know uh, this was in LA. in LA and then we, and like literally like, the worst part was I had my phone, so I just immediately called my boss to figure out what to do instead of calling the cops, which sort of offended some people. Um, but then we went, <laughs> we went, we like, we we went to the police station, we reported everything, and like this is like freelance videographers, so losing, yeah, you know, they don't have like the money to replace their gear. Like this is an absolute nightmare. Some of those cameras, honestly, like at Global, those cameras are worth more than the annually. That is an insane yeah. piece of equipment to have to replace. And so we drove out to Anaheim and couldn't find a bar so we just went to denny's and i at like midnight i just bought everyone denny's breakfast and we just sat there grown men like sadly eating denny's it was the worst night oh of my, my life <laughs> so that's an anaheim story for you all right um, so yeah, I, we have like six minutes so i know we're gonna take this even more off the tracks um i've done some research over rob is here. never gonna let me go no rob's again. never gonna let us come back yeah. I'm actually really scared to see him this afternoon now with the search game. <laughs> you guys are just going off the rails. All right. So, like. as it turns out, some of the um, biggest North American water parks are not in current NHL cities, but they do point to potential expansion destinations. Oh. I give you Schlitterbahn, Kansas City water park. What, can you repeat the city name again? Schlitterbahn. Schlitterbahn? Schlitterbahn. Schlitterbahn. Yeah. Actually, I think a kid got decapitated we there. We a year. water park oh. podcast. Yeah. Did you, uh, just, we, what, did you just say someone got decapitated there? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you after. Clark Bishop. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no. no. Two more. Two more. I want to hear more about these Big water Rivers Water Park and Adventures in Houston, Texas. And oh. my personal favorite, Dollywood Splash Country. The Dollyville Danglers. That would be great. Apparently, there's a tornado warning outside of Lethbridge, just so that everyone knows. I mean, I think we can probably wrap here, right? I, I mean, like we, don't, we're just, yeah. we don't need to go right okay. to three. Yeah. A couple different I'm, things I'm, here. So I'm checking with the producers. There's a tornado warning. Like, this is the, like. I, I'll tell you the decapitation story after. Oh, I can't wait to I, hear that one. Yeah, we're not doing that just now, no, though. We're not but doing what, that we on the show. Sorry, do, folks. what we are going to do, say the guests are brought to you today by Ski Seller Snowboard. They opened their doors in Calgary back in 1946. That's 76 years here in Calgary. For the summer, please visit them at the McLeod Trail location by Chinook Center. Of course, they're experts when it comes to skis and snowboards, but they are so much more. Ask about snow skating. Check out their clothing and warm weather gear, too. Anyways. Stop, Danny. That was a great job. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry. The good folks you. at Ski Seller Snowboard um, deserve better than that. So, like, go to I the just, McLeod Trail location. I know it is hiking season. I it is camping really season. Want. They got some camping Guys, stuff. Guys, we got to cut this off. I'm so sweaty. I'm just saying, the last if you're, half if you're hour into of this show was not skiing, snowboarding, now is the time of year to get gear. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Julian, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Cammy. You're the best. Congratulations again on your award. From the Oodle Please Noodle Studio, off, Danny's brain off. has Please melted into noodles. Off. Goodbye, folks.